Sure thing. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all of you again to another session of the college. The college has consists of the following format. First, there'll be a brief announcements period, followed by our speaker, Kenneth Williams, who will be talking about the surrender of democracy. Then we'll um, take entertain questions and answers for our speaker. And afterwards, we'll have our infamous rebuttal period. We'll finish up about nine o'clock or thereabouts. And uh, once we get into it, we'll be getting into it. There's two rules to the College of Complexes. One is no personal attacks, and the second is one fool at a time, or vice versa. But those are the only two rules we have. And Charlie, if anybody has announcements to the good of the uh, club, let them speak now. Otherwise, we'll let Charlie go with the announcements real quick. All right. Welcome to meeting number 3,652 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. First of all, again, we have an email group. Uh, there's instructions on our website. If you'd like to get on it, sign up to get an email or two a week right at the top, join the Google group. And we also have a meetup group, which functions much in the same fashion, which you can sign up for very easily. Uh, and although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Uh, uh, next week on February the 12th, we're gonna have, host the Illinois Green Party. Uh, they're gonna be having initiative, tell you how to get initiatives on the ballot. And they have a Chicago uh, petition that they're circulating. So the Green Party, uh, on the 19th, uh, Samfield Smith uh, will be talking about the war on Venezuela, uh, how people don't care for the socialism policies of that nation. So uh, the war, the U.S. war uh, on, against Venezuela. On February the 26th, uh, an academic, an author of a book is going to talk about uh, self-driving cars, uh, are this achievable or not? So uh, the transportation will be the On March the 5th, our own Dan Weinberg will be discussing issues regarding food or water. He has concerns regarding uh, the quality of food that we're, we're consuming and the water that we're drinking. So. March 5th, he's got all kinds of links there on the website. On March the 12th, Sandfield Smith will return, and this time we'll be discussing the war on Nicaragua, Los Santanistas, El Camino Luminoso. So uh, that should be a hot one. On March the 19th, we're going to hear from an author who has written a memoir as well as produced a manifesto. So take a look at it. He supplied the first chapter. Uh, uh, he's reading it uh, so you can get a flavor of where he's coming from. Uh, let's see. We're heading into April. Forgot March 26th, Charlie. Oh, oh, yes. We can't forget March the 26th. Thank you. Uh, Jan Lee we will be returning and talking about how the earth is operating under with the yin-yang dynamism, a world view, oh. which would be very interesting. Heading into April, April the 2nd, the Libertarian Party will be telling us their candidate for uh, statewide office. Mr. Robbins will be telling us regarding uh, government and so forth is uh, okay. Heading into April the 9th, we're getting into our Earth Day series of speakers, special Earth Day series of speakers, beginning with uh, the One Earth Collective, Chicago-based organization, not been to the college before, uh, noted for putting on the film festivals, um, very good film festivals. On the 16th of April, we'll look at an alternative fuels, hydrogen, uh, to arrive at a net zero 
carbon economy. You all want a net zero economy, I would resume. On April the 23rd, the uh, Green Party will be returning. This time the issue will be water uh, and the candidates for the uh, Water Reclamation District um, will be giving their presentations seeking your support. Uh, on April the 30th, we're gonna take a look at the forest uh, situation in the United States and proof that there's a primitive species residing in those forests and why they should be restored and preserved and restored. Don't miss that one, folks. And then we are finally on May the 14th, a new group, part of uh, 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 Invisible Illinois called the Truth Brigade. Now the next open dates are May 7th, May Day's program, looking for somebody on organized labor. Otherwise, the dates will be 21st and 28th are open. And that's about it. Thank you very much, sir. Take it away. Okay, are there anybody else who's got announcements for the good of the... Uh, no, they call it the uh, Apple Wallet, which is what oh, it is. I'd like to make an announcement. Go ahead, Margaret. Um, I would really thank to, like to thank you very much, Tim, because I noticed that the recordings of the, the videos of previous uh, mm. or whatever, the, episodes of this have been updated and i really well, it's going that. it's only going back to october but there's going to be a lot more coming oh, in you put two years in there it is. <laughs> that's what i gotta do put two years in <laughs> at a time like santa claus no <laughs> but this one will be uploaded right away probably tomorrow or what about me i had a post it too yeah. <laughs> you don't thank me no i don't think charlie did a lot of work to get him on the site right away too so. no i think you know well then thank you to both of you i i just really right. um, i was able to go back and and well you, yeah um i yeah, you get all the credit no just, <laughs> no well, you get part of it you get part of it the thing you? is a lot of this has to go up anyway we'll we'll get moving on it so thanks margaret um part of uh, never mind all right. Yeah. Between my mom and my dad in a nursing home, it's crazy. <laughs> we don't think he's going to make it though. Um, so mom's dad? Uh, my father, he's been in a nursing home since about Christmas. Oh, time. <laughs> oh, I'm and sorry. I'm sorry. my mom is, uh, she recovered from a, uh, uh, a fall recently that she fell in a walnut last spring. She's finally getting her energy back up and getting somewhat normal she did the grocery store on her cane today so that was good here but anyway we gotta get uh going and so uh in lieu if there's no more announcements uh um i uh will let our speaker tonight uh, kenneth william take it away and the floor is yours kenneth again while kenneth is speaking we'd like all of you to mute at least until uh questions are are until question time and then we'll take it from there more hello janice how you doing and uh whoever bob how you doing so hi kenneth, i'm great how are you we're fine okay let's let our speaker kenneth go and uh kenneth please take it away okay okay good evening uh my presentation uh this evening it has to do with, are the Democrats doing enough to protect democracy? I certainly think they should, but open question, are they doing enough? Now, the outline of what I'm gonna talk about is, first, we're gonna talk about the Republican Party. Uh, I see it as being a radicalized and anti-democratic party at this point. I'll describe some of the actions Republicans have taken to attack democracy. I'm going to describe the uh, democratic response to the Republican attacks on democracy. And I'll discuss why I think those democratic responses are inadequate. Talk about what the Democrats could be doing 
to defend democracy. And I'll explain some of the reasons why I think Democrats are failing to defend democracy. Finally, we're going to talk about the consequences of them not taking a stronger stance on, on the defense of democracy. And then finally, I will talk something about what citizens can do in the absence of a more robust uh, defense of democracy from the uh, government under the control of the Democrats. <clears throat> the Republican Party, as it is now, I think most reasonable observers, is a radicalized anti-democratic party. I think uh, the majority of people who look at this party today would kind of agree on that, unless they are invested in being part of this radicalized party itself. Uh, you, you have people like Andy Biggs and Madison Cawthon and Mo Brooks, people who uh, repeatedly call for violence, repeatedly support the idea that uh, violently trying to overturn the results of the 2020 election is somehow legitimate. Now, this view, which you know, which we would think is kind of a view of a few crazy fringe characters in the Republican Party, the RNC uh, just yesterday or the day before issued a uh, a censure of Liz Cheney and Adam Kissinger, in which they uh, affirmed. That, that they thought what happened on January 6th was legitimate political protests and the Democrats were, were uh, unreasonably persecuting the citizens who were engaged in normal political activity. That, I mean, that's, that's just this week. And uh, so there's a couple of other data points that kind of show you just how radical the Republican Party has become. More than two, this is one that I always keep in mind. More than two thirds of Republicans believe the big lie that Trump really won the election. Almost half of Republicans admitted being willing to ditch democracy. Almost one third of Republicans believe violence may be justified. A majority of Republicans believe QAnon. This is the this is the conspiracy theory that says that the uh, the Democratic uh, uh, prominent Democrats are engaged in a conspiracy to uh, both molest children and to cannibalize babies. Uh, a majority of Republicans believe QAnon is mostly or partly true. Tucker Carlson, the most popular commentator on Fox openly expresses admiration for Hungarian strongman Viktor Orban and urges Americans to follow Orban's example. Senator Mike Lee of Utah says, we are not a democracy and that's a good thing, according to uh, Senator Lee. On January 6th, after watching the rioters beat up the police with flagpoles and spray them with bear spray and tase them. And, 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 and we had one uh, a police officer with his head caught in a revolving door. After witnessing this on January 6th, two thirds of Republican House members, two thirds of them voted to overturn the results of the election. So that was their response on January 6th. On that day, a mob of supporters, Trump supporters, attacked the Capitol and he beat up and injured police officers and attempted to violently prevent the certification of the 2020 election. And then they and then they proceeded to vote to overturn the uh, the legislators, the Republican legislators proceeded to vote in political concert with the rioters. Since that time, 19 states controlled by Republicans have passed at least 33 new laws, making it harder to vote. The new voting laws give Republicans the power to take over elections in specific counties. Now, which counties do you think they want to take specific control over? Uh, uh, someone please give.
which counties do we think they're going to want to take over? Um, it's going to be counties like Fulton County in Georgia. That's where Atlanta is. Harris County in Texas, where Houston is. It'll be places like, it'll, it'll, it'll be these kind of counties where Republicans will want to take over and try to change the results of elections. Republicans have also proposed that state legislatures, le state legislatures should be able to select uh, electors for the, for the electoral college, regardless of what the popular vote for president in that state was. So for example, if the good people of Wisconsin decide to vote for Joe Biden in 2024, there are Republicans saying the state legislature should just be able to just pick some uh, electors who will be for the Republican candidate. This is a credibly radical idea, which of which uh, uh, it's amazing we're not talking more about it. But basically, they're saying that the state legislature just has the right to take away the right to vote for president from the American people. This this ought to be a story that people are talking about every day. Republicans are purging their moderates. They removed Liz Cheney from uh, leadership. Yesterday, they censured uh, both she and Adam Kissinger. Uh, they censured them. That's the RNC nationally did that. They're running primaries against election officials who honored the 2020 election, uh, like Georgia Secretary of State Raffensperger. And they've uh, conducted fraudulent audits, as they did in Arizona, where they had the uh, cyber ninjas come in, uh, you know, looking for the bamboo and the ballots. And after spending a lot of money and taking a lot of time, they came up with, oh, yeah, Joe Biden really won the election by more votes than we thought the first time. But while they're doing that, they're basically still claiming voter fraud without evidence, and they're, st and they're sticking to that. Now, before we got to this era with these really intense attacks on democracy that now it's becoming obvious to most people, Republicans have really been attacking democracy for quite a while. It didn't start uh, this year or last year. It didn't start with Donald Trump. In 2013, in the Shelby versus Holder decision, the court weakened the uh, 1965 Voting Rights Act by getting rid of preclearance. Preclearance is what would have prevented many of the kind of laws that we've had recently, the uh, voter ID laws that are aimed at reducing participation of, of uh, say, minority populations and of other people, or, or doing these radical gerrymandered maps of the state. That used to have to get cleared through the Justice Department before you could do things like that. But after 2013, uh, that barrier was removed and these states, they tripped over themselves running down to the state legislature to pass these kind of restrictive laws. And now it's becoming more and more aggressive. Republic the Republican Senate prevented President Obama from making a Supreme Court appointment in 2016. Mitch McConnell has said he would also block Biden if the Republicans retake the Senate. This is another one of these incredibly radical steps, steps by the Republicans that kind of sails under the radar, at least as far as the media, the way the media behaves. And uh, we don't really, we, we don't really uh, talk about how serious these kind of changes are. If you're going to think about it now, uh, our theory of government is checks and balances, right? So every branch is supposed to be able to check every other branch. But if the president is a Democrat, they will not be allowed to exercise checks on the judicial branch. Well, if that's going to be true, if that's going to be the system, why would Democratic presidents be bound by the decisions of a court where they don't get to pick anybody? But anyway, we don't really ask that question, but that's what's implied by what Mitch McConnell did. You, you, how can you maintain the so-called system of checks and balances if you're not going to allow 
the uh, the presidency to, to exercise all their normal powers whenever the president is a Democrat. Republican gerrymandered uh, uh, the the uh, the maps based on the 2020 census in Texas. This uh, will result in less representation for minorities, despite the fact that minorities accounted for 95% of the, of the state's growth in population. So 95% of the growth came from minorities. And uh, so they created, found ways through gerrymandering to create additional uh, uh, majority white districts. Now, these are all the things the Democrats have been doing. Well, what have the, what, I mean, excuse me, the things the Republicans have been doing. So what have the Democrats done in response? Surely the Democrats have, you know, united and formed a united front to protect democracy in the face of all these attacks. Well, you would be, you would be um, mistaken if you think that's the response. But the Democrats have done a few things. They impeached Donald Trump for inciting uh, the mob to riot uh, on January 6th. They've also created a January 6th commission to investigate the insurrection. Uh, and the commission seems to be doing serious work. But what Democrats have failed to do is to pass legislation to protect voting rights. Uh, in particular, because of uh, Senators Manchin and Cinema they have absolutely uh, decided that voting rights are not as important as the filibuster, which is kind of an insane idea since voting rights are part of the constitution and the filibuster is not even a law, it's just a senatorial rule. But somehow those, those, those two particular Democrats made the decision that despite all the things Republicans are doing to attack democracy, what the thing to protect is the filibuster. Now, what happened on January 6th, and, and, and this is becoming clearer and clearer based on uh, information we're finding out from the January 6th commission and, and things we're finding out from journalists, is it wasn't the, um, that wasn't, that, that was an insurrection. It was an attempted coup, but it wasn't the entirety of the coup. Uh, Trump, and his supporters began planning on how to overturn the election days after the election. I think it was, it was, it was as soon as two days after the election, they, they got to work on planning on how to overturn the election. And they did many, many different things. And uh, despite all these things they've done, they had fake electors. There was a plan to grab the, uh, the voting machines. Uh, there, there was attempts to get the Justice Department to intervene in the election, the Department of Defense, Homeland Security. We found out a lot of things, but despite all the things that we found out so far, no one below, above the level of the actual rioters has been prosecuted for January 6th. This is more than a year later, and nobody above the level of the folks that were on the street has been prosecuted. Democrats, have, uh, this always sounds bizarre to me, but they have continued to stress bipartisanship even as Republicans have become more extreme. I'm not sure how that's actually supposed to work, but there are a lot of Democrats who still with a straight face say the key to making government work is bipartisanship. Democrats have not made the issue of protecting democracy central to their in their political messaging. This is not what Democrats even talk about. You know, as there are some Democrats who are exceptions. Again, I can't say this is true of every Democrat, but as a party, this ain't their central message. This is not what you hear when most of them talk. They're still talking about how uh, you know how the infrastructure bill is going to benefit people, or and they might do build back better. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. But you don't get. The, the sense of urgency that I think you should get from a political party facing these kinds of attacks on the uh, political system. Democrats have stressed getting things done. 
and that again the infrastructure build back better and, and they're hoping that if those kind of projects get passed voters will will reward them for a, a job well done so they say okay you got things done so that's great so yeah we'll pull the lever for you again there is no plan and almost no discussion of a plan to counter the Republican plans to overturn the 2024 election. Republicans are making it plain as day that in 2024, that if they don't win the election, they plan to overturn the election. They're making it clear. Democrats are not really seem they don't they they don't seem to uh, they don't seem to have fully accepted that. And they don't seem to have really said, you know, this is serious. We have to have a plan to counter it. Uh, Republicans, are, they're putting people in positions on uh, as secretary of state to run the elections at a state level. They're, they're trying to replace Republicans who supported the results of the 2020 election. They're trying to get rid of them. They're not doing that for nothing. The Democratic Party is letting Republicans do whatever they want to do and pretending it can conduct business as usual. They're just acting, they're just acting like, oh, it's just normal times. Allowing Republicans to create additional barriers to voting will reduce Democratic turnout. Democrats need high turnout to win. Democrats, don't, you know, Democrats are not going to win. Uh, if there's necessarily if there's high turnout, but they virtually never win if there's low turnout. Being not unwilling to protect the voting rights of their most loyal voters will tend to demoralize their base. Democrats do not seem to be taking Republican plans to overturn the next election seriously. Even though Republicans are creating laws that will allow them to take control of the presumably uh, uh, take control of and presumably overturn results in specific counties, they are staffing election administration with supporters of the big lie. The Republicans are normalizing the concept that state legislatures should be able to, to appoint electors contrary to the popular vote for president in a given state. If Republicans take control of the House in 2022, Kevin McCarthy and the great majority of the Republicans have already voted to overturn the last election. What are the what are the odds that they're going to uphold the next one if Joe Biden wins? So that that's why I think the Democratic response is inadequate. Now, if we imagine a Democratic Party that functioned very differently than the way the actual Democratic Party functions, here's some of the things they could do, because they have the power. They control the House of Representatives, the Senate, the White House. They are in a position to make law. They could pass, they should, they can and should pass the Freedom to Vote Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, and the For the People Act. Should pass all the legislation. They should add four or more seats to the Supreme Court. In fact, I, uh, it, it, that you have to do that because you have a Supreme Court now, which is, is as radical as the rest of the Republican Party. Uh, this party, uh, this Supreme Court is willing to strike down uh, pretty much all the laws that were passed since, since uh, Franklin Roosevelt was president. Uh, anything of a progressive nature since the Roosevelt presidency and maybe everything of a progressive nature that was passed since Teddy Roosevelt. They, they, they really want to take us back to the uh, late 19th century. They are highly ideological and they overturn president, uh, precedent uh, in terms of uh, historic long-held positions in law. They, they, they overturn them without blinking. A Democratic Party that was trying to defend democracy would also make D.C. a state. This would give the Democrats uh, probably two more senators, which would make it a little harder for the Republicans to uh, 
to maintain control of the Senate. Uh, and, and, and that's so important because we, there's so much power in the U.S. Senate. I would also give Puerto Rico the option of becoming a state. Puerto Rico as a, as a, as a 50, uh, 52nd state in this scenario would also tend to uh, be better ground for the Democrats than uh, for the Republicans. Not quite as good as DC, but it would probably be better for the Democrats. They need to prosecute all the people, including Trump, who are responsible for the attempted coup on January 6, 2021. You need to actually enforce the law. This is so important because if you let people try to do a coup d'etat, which is what they tried, and there's no punishment, then if there's no punishment, then it was just practice. They are coming back. They are going to learn from whatever uh, mistakes they made the first time, and they are more likely to succeed the next time. It is incredibly dangerous to not prosecute the people who did this coup d'etat. These folks are on TV bragging what they did. You know, uh, 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 what's his name? Um, uh, Peter Navarro, uh, Trump's economic guy, on there talking about a Green, a green Bay suite bragging about what, the, what they did in the coup. And um, it, it scares me that the, the Justice Department under Merrick Garland, uh, I think that's part of the inadequate response by Democrats that they have not taken action against these people. Democrats need to be calling out Republicans for attacking democracy at every turn. They uh, uh, People don't know something is an issue unless you talk about it. And Democrats, you know, they, they sit there and say, well, you know, it's going to be a pocketbook election. And, you know, and, and as though things are normal times, that's not going to get it. You need to tell people that this is going to affect them. And it is. If, if Republicans create, uh, we, we already see some evidence of this. For example, in Texas, after they passed the law to restrict voting, what's the next thing they did? Then they passed their crazy abortion law. First, you create a system where it's going to be difficult for people to respond by voting, and then you could do anything you want and, and not have to worry about the voters uh, holding you accountable at the, at the ballot box. We're going to see many more examples of that if Republicans can succeed in locking themselves in power at a national level. The Democrats should explain that we are a republic, as the Republicans are saying, but we are a democratic republic, and that is consistent with the Constitution. They need to directly address, you shouldn't let a Mike Lee make a statement that we're not a democracy and just leave that hanging in the air. Somebody should respond to that. We need, we need to also say that democracy is the right moral choice for America. Indeed, it's the only moral ch choice that is acceptable. We have to make that the issue. Uh, Democrats often want to respond to things in kind of a kind of a technical way. They 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 want to just talk about uh, numbers and, and 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 percentages and things like this. You have to make the case that there is a right and a wrong, and it is wrong for a state legislature to overturn the votes of the people of a state. And if you don't make that a, 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 an issue, well then Republicans will just quietly do it and then pretend it's a normal thing as though we were doing it all along. Now, I think there's some reasons why Democrats are failing to defend democracy. Of course, in my picture there, I have two of the reasons, two of the really main reasons they're failing to defend democracy. But there are other reasons. Democ Democrats are ideologically divided. Some moderates think doing bipartisan legislation with Republicans is more to their political advantage than working with progressives in their own party. Now, that, that, that let me explain. Let's talk about exactly what I mean by that. Because we actually saw them literally do that. We saw a group of moderate uh, Democratic senators 
meet with a group of so-called moderate Republican senators. There's not really such a thing as a moderate Republican senator, uh, uh, spoiler alert, but they met with them and they worked out their so-called bipartisan infrastructure deal. So they were willing to negotiate with the Republicans, but then when it came to time to negotiate with the left wing of their own party on Build Back Better, they said, oh, <laughs> can't make a deal with those people. Now, the, the Democrats who engaged in this behavior think this type of thing helps them. But the only chance Democrats have of saving democracy is unity within their own coalition. They can't save democracy or even save themselves as a party by making deals with Republicans. But, this, but some of them believe that. So that's one of the uh, uh, main weaknesses of why the Democrats have been unable to defend democracy, because the more moderate and more conservative Democrats think that their bread is buttered by making deals with Republicans as opposed to uniting with the left wing of their own party. Then the Republican attacks on voting rights specifically attacks African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, uh, these, these parts of, of the uh, population, which are major parts of the Democratic coalition, but some Democrats, particularly some uh, Democrats who are white and who are politically moderate, simply don't feel threatened enough by those attacks. They feel those attacks, well, th those people are going to have to stand in line a little longer. And uh, well, Joe Manchin said, well, they'll just have to try to out-organize what's happening. This, so it's not, they, th they don't think it's their problem. They think it's the problem of the brown people, but they'll be, they think they themselves will be okay. Joe Manchin has consistently maintained that he will support the filibuster and will only support bipartisan legislation on voting rights. So the whole Republican party is organized to restrict voting rights. And Joe Manchin says the only way at the federal level he can support any defense of voting rights is if the Republicans agree. The same Republicans who are dismantling voting rights every chance they get at the state level. So it makes no sense, but Joe Manchin doesn't think this threatens him. And I don't think he's the only uh, uh, person in the Democratic Party in that political faction that feels that way. The Biden's administration has suggested that, even Biden suggested that activists can out-organize to overcome voter suppression. So, uh, so Stacey Abrams or someone is going to save the Democratic Party from the, um, from the anti-voting rights legislation that the Republicans are putting in place. The dependence of much of the Democratic Party on big money donors inhibits them from passing legislation supported by most of their voters. So their money donor, their, their donors, for example, did not want them to raise the minimum wage, but their, their voters certainly wanted them to raise the minimum wage. Their, their voters wanted them to pass Build Back Better, but some of the donors didn't want them to do that. And so this party, as its allegiance to the, 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 the donor's money, is sometimes uh, apparently stronger than their allegiance to voters, they again, what happens? You demoralize your base. You're teaching them that why show up to vote anyway? Yeah. Now, one of the major uh, things that's going on in this attack on democracy and on the uh, Democrats' apparent inability to figure out what to do to defend democracy, a lot of it has to do with race. Now, for the Republicans, they use race as a club. What do I mean when I say that? Re Republicans, and if you look back, we can look back as recently as the, as the Virginia gubernatorial election, where the uh, Virginia uh, gubernatorial candidate, Laughlin, ran, uh, or Youngkin, excuse me, Youngkin, ran against what he called critical race theory, which of course is a totally bogus issue. It's not something that's taught in public school, but he uses it. Now, if you pay attention to Republicans, Youngkin is not unique in using that as a tactic. 
Donald Trump famously came down the escalator, said Mexicans are criminals and rapists. Uh, before him, uh, George H. Bush had his Willie Horton ad. Ronald Reagan had his welfare queens. Richard Nixon had crime in the streets. George W. Bush didn't use race in quite that way in the general election, but when he was in the uh, primary in, in the year 2000 in South Carolina, his campaign put out a rumor that John McCain had a, 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 multi, a, a, a black child out of wedlock. Uh, the McCain family apparently uh, adopted a, a, a little girl from India who had brown skin. They put out a rumor that uh, uh, McCain had, uh, you know, some kind of black uh, a woman on the side and had a baby with her. So Republicans have consistently, again and again, used this issue in order to rile up their base, in order to make them angry, and to get them to come out to vote. Now, when Republicans do this, the Democratic uh, response is to pretty much ignore it. The Democrats, Republicans are talking about race all the time. Democrats like to pretend it's not an issue. Their response is usually silence. They don't really defend the people who are attacked with race. They're more likely to try to avoid talking about it and to focus on things that could unify us, like getting things done and bipartisanship. This is what moderate Democrats tend to want to do. They want to unify us, uh, by, and they think that by talking past the issue, they can get they can get us uh, they can make the issue go away. So Republicans use race to galvanize their base. On the Democratic side, it paralyzes and divides the Democratic Party, not because the Democrats are are actually addressing the issue, but because they try to avoid a, addressing the issue. And when they try to avoid it. Their base, who are the targets of the Republicans, feel they don't have our back. They're not doing anything to protect us. They, 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 they're acting like nothing to see here. We just want to uh, just get on and, 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 and sit down and make some bipartisan deals. But Republicans are using this systematically. The whole race is the whole premise of Trump's big lie. When Trump said they stole the election, the Democrats stole the election, he didn't say the Democrats stole the election in Boston, right? He didn't say the Democrats stole the election in Washington state. No, he said the Democrats stole the election in Detroit. They stole, they stole the election in Philadelphia. They, 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 stole, they stole the uh, election apparently in Atlanta. So he immediately pointed at black and brown communities and say, these are the people who stole the election from us. And this is the same lie that, that energizes the Republican party to this day. Democrats are underestimating this threat because they think it's not directly a threat to them. Now, the consequences of not defending democracy, America will go from being a democratic republic to being a, a kind of autocracy. It might end up with a government that works something like the government of Hungary works right now. That's certainly what Tucker Carlson wants and that's and there seem to be a lot of Republicans who want to bring about that result. If Republicans get this type of power, they're gonna make other changes to the electoral system. Republicans, Democrats are scared to change anything, including the filibuster, but Republicans don't mind making radical changes that they think are to their advantage. So uh, if, they, if they gain control of the government in 2024, they are guaranteed to make significant changes to the electoral system so as to try to further lock in power. Some of the things that will happen is this type of uh, politics, uh, they're going to target racial minorities even more as scapegoats for whatever pro political problems the Republicans have. So there's, there's going to be increased targeting of these minorities with discrimination, repression from the state, and violence from vigilantes. You see Kyle Rittenhouse? Kyle Rittenhouse is celebrated as a hero in the Republican Party. 
he is considered a hero right now. He gets uh, flattering interviews on Fox News. He gets invited to meetings with Republicans. Even, even a Republican who's, who's supposed to be uh, from the halfway sane wing of the party, Chris Christie was praising uh, Kyle Rittenhouse. This is a young, young, a young boy who takes a, a, a gun and kills two people, wounds, seriously wounds a third person, manages to get uh, uh, acquitted in a uh, court where the judge seemed to be prejudiced in his favor. But that's kind of a model of where Republicans want to go. Climate change. You know, we don't have that much time to really do something about climate change. Republicans, uh, the Republican politics still says climate change is a hoax. All of these wildfires and all of these hurricanes and floods have not convinced them so far. And uh, they're willing to uh, you know, drill baby drill in the face of this uh, impending crisis. Abortion rights will end nationally. We were talking about that earlier. Economic inequality will be turbocharged. Why? Because they're probably going to give some more tax cuts to really rich people. And the minimum wage of 725 will be kind of a symbolic number, uh, which it already is, but it will uh, it is unlikely to you know really ever come up under Republican control. Millions will lose access to health care. You know, Republicans really don't believe in public health care systems. They would like to privatize all of Medicare. They've privatized part of it uh, now already with uh, the bill that George W. Bush used. And uh, they despise Medicaid and any other system. They, they'd like to privatize the VA, but even, but, even, uh, but even Republican veterans don't really want them to do that. But these are the kind of things that are going to be targeted. Gun laws, as they exist in Texas, will be nationalized. The Supreme Court is already considering making uh, New York City uh, let uh, folks walk around with guns in New York City. So let, let them get on the subway train with guns, you know, just walk around. I mean, this is a case they're already considering. And if they and if Republicans think they can't get voted out of office, you know, they're quite capable of doing something that radical. Corruption will reach Russian levels in America. This is something that Trump and his friends were already moving towards. Uh, they, they, our system isn't broke down enough to let them do that yet. But if they get control of the government again, this is the kind of thing we're going to see. One of the things we uh, that has happened in other countries where democracy has been um, attacked in this way. It happened in Russia. It has happened in uh, Hungary. Is that well? The right wing folks are very conscious of the of the need to control a media narrative. With the uh, with the right wing media that exists in the country, uh, things like Fox and One American News Network and Newsmax, they already have a very robust propaganda network of their own. But everybody doesn't have to listen to it. Now, but if you can find a way to shut down the competing uh, news uh, uh, agencies, uh, that's something that that's going to be on the table, I think, if they get this kind of power. Now, the last line of defense for American democracy are the citizens, right? And uh, now, this part, I know this first thing here is, is a kind of hard pill to swallow. But no matter what we think of the Democratic Party, uh, we need the Democratic Party to be in power in order to fulfill all these things to not happen. So uh, we would need to work to try to keep them in power, to keep them in control of Congress, for example, to keep them in control, particularly of the Senate, but also of the House of Representatives. We need to vote. We need to register other people to vote. We need to encourage people to vote. You need to join organizations that are working at the local level to promote democracy. You need to contribute funds if you're able to do that. Work the polls. Uh, ordinary citizens being engaged is the best uh, 
you know, given given what the Democratic Party seems to be capable of doing in this moment, is the best defense of democracy that we can uh, have. Now, if the Republicans do uh, take power with the, with this authoritarian movement, uh, we're going to need to prepare for a uh, massive nonviolent resistance to uh, this kind of authoritarian government. Uh, and this means mass demonstrations, labor strikes, and boycotts. Uh, whatever power the government has to restrict voting rights, they can't control uh, everybody's labor. We saw right here in the pandemic, we've had what's called the great resignation. Lots of folks just have just checked out of the labor force and, and it's created a significant labor shortage. It's not the kind of thing that the government can uh, prevent. We saw a few years uh, back that there were these teacher strikes in West Virginia uh, and it's very red state, but they couldn't stop the people from going on strike. They also can't control uh, people's purchasing power. Remember the NFL fired Colin Kaepernick because he was protesting about police violence uh, against African-Americans uh, under uh, as part of Black Lives Matter. Nike, you know, Nike, I guess they looked at the data and they hired him for an ad campaign and their sales went up. I mean, which, which kind of like made uh, the minds of, of conservative Republicans explode, but but the purchasing power in America's economy is not lined up with the political power. There is a lot more purchasing power in blue states and even in and even in red states. The 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 economy uh, the, the the center of the economy is in the cities, right? If you were to strip away the big cities of Texas. You you would you would have uh, you'd be left with Nebraska, you know. I mean, it would it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a wealthy state. It's the cities, and that's true of Georgia. That's true. It's true of all, that's true of all these places. The economic energy in America is in these big cities that the right wing hates so much. But that's where the that's that's where the money is being generated, and the blue states in general generate more to the uh, GDP than, than the red states do. Nonviolent protests are always scary to authoritarians. You would think since I'm talking about nonviolence that they wouldn't be scared, but you, you have to look at the history of it. Uh, and, and whether it's Moscow or Cairo, or whether it was uh, like in Lafayette Park on June 1st, uh, 2020, that's when Trump sent in the National Guard against the nonviolent protesters. Uh, there's something about protests, massive protests, that scares the bejeevous out of um, authoritarians. And so it's something we, we need to be doing or planning to do. If Democrats let democracy die, these are some of the things that we can do to revive it. Okay. And uh, that, that was some... Uh, additional backup if we needed to talk about that topic. But anyway, so that was uh, that's my presentation. Now we can go on to discuss it. Okay, I did oh, mute everybody as they were entering in, so please unmute and uh, ask questions. The first thing, Kenneth Williams, I'd like to ask you about is, have you, are you familiar? Let's thank our speaker first of all. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first question is going to come from me. What do you think of the Lincoln Project? We're unmuted. I, 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 I mean, I like the Lincoln Project. They do, uh, I think they do good commercials uh, to kind of uh, take some jabs at the uh, Trump and the authoritarian Republicans. So I, I think that's, that's useful as far as it goes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, just very quickly, what are your main news sources, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, my, my main news source is uh, I, uh, you know, I, I watch a lot of MSNBC. I, I also watch the, um, let's see, the uh, CNN a little bit. Uh, 
uh, watch the Young Turks. Uh, I, you know, I read the um, Mother Jones Nation magazine. You know, things like are you, that. Are you familiar with uh, the BBC and the Deutsche Welle and France? Yeah, I watch the B I watch the BBC sometimes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, I was just curious. Okay, and that's all my own questions. Now remember, I'm going to have Janice. Ginsler, since he first raised her hand, and then Margaret Gillette. So, Janice, if you got a question, please, uh, we'd like to see you when you yeah. ask. So, just go ahead. Yeah. All right, Janice, you're the floor is yours. Thank your you. Um, Kenneth, Ken Kenneth, why do you yes. think Democrats are the answer? Why do I? Think? I don't. I didn't say that. I... For us and. Why money? Don't you think money in politics is this is the ultimate corruption? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I think money. I, let me let me let me just. I just want to um, how you say respond to one part of what you said. I I don't think that Democrats in a, some generic sense are are the answer. What I think is that in America, in order to. Um, whole political power you you have to be involved with a political party now that's not the only way to take political action but it's the only way to run the government and we have <laughs> these we have these two political parties and uh so you're either going to get with a or b i don't see a lot of hope that the republican party is going to defend democracy at this point so we, if we're going to defend democracy, we're going to have to get the Democratic Party to transform, right? We end democracy. I mean, we send $4 billion almost every single year since 1970 to Israel. So they meant ethnic genocide, for example. Well, I mean, there's, there's all, all kinds of things you can oh, criticize. Really? But what I'm focused on, what I'm focused get on- Get rid of them all. <laughs> well, there's, there's, I, I don't know what I don't even know what that would mean, right? What what does what you know what? I have no idea what get rid of them all would mean, right? There, if we want to, unless we want to accept the Republicans, you have no idea what what can be. I don't have no idea what get rid of them all would mean. I don't know oh, what that would mean. Oh. because because. In, in our in our like Get I said in our in our government <laughs> in our political um, system. I'm country. saying that we always yeah. vote for the incumbent. What? Well, I I don't know if we always vote for the incumbent. We don't have to vote for the incumbent. We can if we think we want to vote some people out of office. That's legitimate. You know, uh, if you if you have a viable candidate to replace them with, that that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact. You are going to have to vote some incumbents out of power in order to transform the party. You don't have an argument with me about that, but uh, but but you, but we're going to have to. There's a lot of thinking that the Democrats need to do, and that everybody. And when I say the Democrats, in this sense, I'm really talking about all of us. Not that all of us are literally Democrats, but we are all part of a political coalition which only has a chance of winning if the Democratic Party wins, right? So let's say you're a socialist and you despise the Democrats. Well, you know, the, the Democrats might pass something you agree with and the Republicans probably ain't never going to pass anything you agree with. So it doesn't mean you necessarily agree with the Democrats, but still they remain the vehicle <laughs> that you are, are going to need to invest in in order to get any of the things you care about done. You know, which of the two parties might do something about climate change? It ain't going to be the Republicans. Okay. Um, are you done, Mark? Are you done uh, there, Janice? Okay, let's go to uh, Margaret Gillette next. Uh, Margaret, you got the next question. Okay, uh, there are three questions very related. Kenneth, the presentation is so on target. Have some radical Republicans already infiltrated the Democratic Party? Why are the Democrats, including the moderate Democrats, blind to what is happening? And finally, or are they blind or do they actually want what these radical Republicans stand for? 
Are we, uh, bottom line, are we actually dealing with Democrats that are only Democrats in exterior, but that they actually want what these Republicans are suggesting? They're racist themselves and they're anti-climate, et cetera. That, that's a great question, Margaret. And, uh, uh, Analyzing the behavior of the Democrats, in particular of the moderate Democrats, is, is almost a hobby of mine. It's it's because uh, their their behavior seems to be pretty odd. Democrats. Uh, but now here's the thing: I don't think that okay. these. Hold on, uh, hold on, hold on. Jake, I'm going to mute you again because you're. I know you want a question, but okay. you're, you're coming with a lot of background. Okay. Sorry. All right, I'm going to mute you real quick, and then when you're ready, go ahead. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Do you know how to yeah. unmute? So please, if you have a question, uh, if you okay, want me to put you down you. for a question at, uh, okay, never mind. Go ahead. Okay, I'm Margaret. So, so the the thing in answer to your question, I don't, and I know this is this is hard to really. It, it's difficult. See, there are some of these Democrats who are behaving so badly that a lot of people are saying, "Well, they're really they're really not Democrats; they're really Republicans." But here's the reason why, as bad as they are, even Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are kind of Democrats. Uh, now, here's what I mean by that. When you think of today's Republican Party, and you think of the fact that both Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema voted to impeach Trump twice, twice, there's only there's only one Republican who, uh, actual Republican who voted to impeach Trump twice. That's Mitt Romney. And there's and then there's another like another half dozen who voted to impeach him one time. Uh, that that's almost unbelievable behavior to Republicans. Also, Manchin and Cinema did vote for the American Rescue Plan. That was the plan where they originally were sending out three hundred dollars a month to uh, uh, per, per 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 child three hundred or two fifty depending upon how old the child was. That was the first massive piece of legislation that the Biden administration passed. They voted for that. So the reason why you have these kind of conflicts inside the Democratic Party is because the coalition is so broad. Uh, because in our country, because again, because we just have the two parties, everybody who is anywhere left of center of the Republicans uh, functions as a Democrat, even though their version of being a Democrat is very, very different from maybe the center of the party and certainly very different from the Elizabeth Warrens or the Bernie Sanders. And so the Democratic Party has what is in effect a conservative faction. The Republican Party doesn't have factions. Everybody has to line up or get out. The Democratic Party has this broad coalition that ranges from a conservative Democrat like Joe Manchin to a socialist like Bernie Sanders. But Joe Manchin is not identical to the Republicans. And it's a mistake to think that. And we sure don't actually want him to actually push the button and become a Republican because the moment he does that, there's no Supreme Court uh, uh, appointee by Biden. There's no other judges appointed by Biden. Lots of other bad things happen if Manchin or Cinema cross the aisle and go over to the Republicans. So uh, it's probably not helpful to actually call them Republicans. And I can show you certain behaviors that are different from the Republicans. Even though they are frustrating, they're certainly not behaving like what we think as Democrats. They're not literally Republicans. Now, the other thing you were saying, are some of them uh, you know, racist or whatever? Do they really agree with the objectives of the uh, Republicans? Uh, I tried to explain in the presentation that uh, the reason why race is a tricky thing for the Democrats, right? It's a tricky thing for the Democrats because the de Democrats depend upon the votes of non-white voters. The quick trivia question, when's the last time Democrats won a majority of white people? Let's, let's, let me say, anybody know that? Real, real quick, anybody know? The last time Democrats won the majority of white people in the election? Trivia question. Not the Civil Rights Act. I mean, once Johnson signed that. Ding, 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 ding. You got it, exactly. Not since 1964 have Democrats won a majority of white people. Okay, so you have this party which depends on the votes of non-white people to get elected, 
but is obsessed with not offending white people on the issue of race. And so they tend to not want to talk about the subject because when the subject is raised, they're concerned that the conservative white Democratic voters will be offended and they'll be turned off. And they're more worried about offending them than they are about worried offending any number of African American voters or any other voters they have. The voters they worry about are the voters, the, the voters who are white and who are most likely to be moderate or conservative. And that makes it very difficult because uh, it, it was really difficult when um, Barack Obama was president because on top of everything else, he's black himself. So he really has a hard time saying anything about race in the Democratic Party. But all Democratic presidents and all Democratic Party leaders seem to struggle with this issue uh, on one sense. They don't have, look, look for example, at how uh, terrified Democrats were of the phrase defund the police. What is that about? Where does the phrase come from? It didn't come from the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party didn't pass any legislation to defund the police. Joe Biden made it clear that he was against defund the police. Nancy Pelosi said, I'm against defund the police. Jim Clyburn said, I'm against defund the police. And yet they are haunted and terrified by the phrase. Why? Because defund the police came out of the Black Lives Matter movement. It is indirectly connected once again to this controversial part of the Democratic coalition. And so Demo Republicans were very clever once they heard this phrase. Republicans didn't want to jump up and say, no, Black lives don't matter, because that doesn't sound good. That doesn't have a good ring to it. You don't want to say that. Or I'm against BLM directly. Again, doesn't sound good. <clears throat> but when they heard defund the police, they can say, I'm against defund the police. And then they felt confident. But they're really talking about the same thing. The, the hostility over the defund the police statement is not about defunding the police. It's anger over the Black Lives Matter movement. And the fact that the Democrats don't seem to realize that and are chief, completely incapable of defending themselves on the issue, all they can say is, I'm not for defunding the police. That's all they can say. So that totally replaced the issue of why did they strangle George Floyd to why are you for defunding the police? You see how you see that's a change of subject to put the Democrats and the left on the defensive about something where they actually had the moral high ground. Now, what it all that's to say is Democrats are ambiguous about the issue of race because they want to do two things. They want black people to keep showing up to vote for them, but they don't want to they don't want to piss off any conservative white people about their association with black people. They're like a man who wants to keep meeting his mistress in the hotel, but he doesn't want to be seen with her in public. That's where they are. So that so not, so not, not they're not literally the same as Republicans on race, <clears throat> but they have, let us say, a conflict of interest. Yes, because after all, one of them are not, were Dixiecrats. You know, I mean, in other well, words. Well, but but, the, but the, the Democrats don't really have any more Dixiecrats. So they're all dead by now, probably, Kenneth. The, well, the, well, or or they they're all Republicans. Republicans. They're, they're all Republicans. The yes. Dixiecrats all joined the Republican Party. And what we used to call Dixiecrat Party in, in American politics is now the base of the Republican Party. Yes. In some cases, for some of the older Republicans, they literally were Dixiecrats earlier in their political career. You know, the people, the peop people like Trent Lott and, and, and Strom Thurmond and these kind of people, they started out as Democrats and they became Republicans. And now they brought in their whole population, the, the base voters, white conservative Southerners who used to be what we call Dixiecrats, they're called Republicans now. But their politics is kind of the same. <clears throat> the Democrats aren't literally, that's, the Democrats don't have a lot of people who have those kind of politics. They really don't. They're, they're a little, but, but, but they're afraid to confront the issue because they're always worried that they're going to lose some voters on their moderate to conservative wing. And that's the wing they worry about. They don't worry about progressives, for example. 
<clears throat> moderate Democrats like to imagine they don't even need progressives. You know, uh, Rahm Emanuel used to call something called hippie, hippie punching or whatever. You know, you know he, he's up there from where, where, yeah, he was the mayor from where you guys are. Yeah, he, he, he despised progressives, right? And, and there's a whole part of the Democratic Party. Uh, uh, you ever see James Carville talking? They despise progressives. They, they like to imagine they don't even need them. But they all, but, but those kind of Democrats who think that way, they all think they need some good old boys who might vote for the Democratic Party and might have a Confederate flag on their truck. That's who they think is going to save them. Or how many times have we heard about this? Housewives in the suburbs. Oh yeah. When they say housewives in the suburbs, you know they, they you know they, they they ain't talking about people who look like me. They are they they're talking about they, they, it's we have these code words. Yes. For different parts of the population, like we all know that inner city means that's one part of the population. Suburban voters means this. <clears throat> Working class voters means that. Y'all y'all could already see the colors. I ain't even got to explain it to you. And so this is this this so the Democrats worry about their right flank all the time. They don't worry about their left flank. They don't worry about non-white voters. They take them for granted. They take those parts of the party for granted. They believe that those people have nowhere to go. <clears throat> and uh, and that's why and that's and that was and that's probably what President Hillary Clinton thought and what President Al Gore thought. That's they they don't they don't think the, their left flank has anywhere to go, and then when they go into the into the ballot box and they and they see a Ralph Nader or a Jill Stein, they're shocked and angry. But they always worry about that right flank. But anyway, I'm sorry. Did I answer your question, Margaret? Oh yes, you are always on target. Glad you're from the Dallas area. Hey, thank you. Was proud. Okay, ready for the next question. I, I'm sorry, uh, Brian's next, and then Ernie. I uh, accidentally muted my microphone, so uh, go ahead, Brian, Hello. and then Ernie. You'll be right. next. Uh, <clears throat> so I have a, a statement and two questions. So, uh, so I'm a libertarian. I don't vote. I used to be a Democrat. I mean, I'm from Chicago, you know, but I stopped voting Democrat when Bill Clinton beat uh, Jerry Brown. I voted for Jerry Brown, uh, but Clinton won. And it was like, ah, it's always, the establishment guy always wins. They run some progressive, you know, get everybody all fired up that there's some justice in the works. And then they vote, you know, the establishment candidate wins. Um, so I, I became a libertarian you know, after I didn't vote for 20 years. <clears throat> um, so in Cook County, the Libertarian Party, you know, myself, ran in the election, we got established party status, which gives us lower signature thresholds for the, the, the seats that our candidates would um, compete for. So the Democratic Party run, that runs Cook County um, they said, well, it, it only applies for countywide, but not for districts within the county. So the Democrat, and, and they've removed any reference of the Libertarian Party as established in the voter guide or the candidate guide. <clears throat> so like they're not even recognizing us. So, so the Democratic Party is not in favor of pluralistic democracy and representation. It is the exact opposite of that. I mean, they challenge and try to keep people off the ballot because they want to maintain power. <clears throat> um, and, and even in your presentation, you said that there are drafting plans to stack the Supreme Court, um, change these others' rules to ensure that the Democratic Party maintains power. So, so my question from that is, why, why aren't the Democrats the authoritarians if they're the ones who are taking all these actions to ensure that they stay in power? Whatever you, whatever you attribute it to, you know, the Republicans or whatever, but it is the Democrats that are working to stay in power. 
you know, to, to, you know, create a one party system. Um, so, so my question well, there is, is question how are the Democrats? Not can, the Democrats? I, can I answer that question before you? Okay. But I have on one more question. I have one more that I'll ask you after this. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I, I just want to answer that question because I want to answer that question while <clears throat> it's in my mind because you just answered that. Okay. For one thing, I didn't say the Democrats were doing any of those things. Oh, That's I've heard them talking about it on the news. I mean, you're not well, the well, first person I've heard it from. Well, well, obviously well, see, thinking about it. Well, 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 this is what Kenneth says they should do. That's not what they're doing. They're not doing any of those things. Oh, None of those God. things I'm doing, they're not doing. They don't dare do any of those things because the Democratic Party, in fact, in fact, those things are not authoritarian things because Republicans could still win if Democrats did all those things. All those things would do would be to slightly tilt the playing field a little bit more fairly in their favor because the by Republicans- By stacking the Supreme Court? No, 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 no. That's, that's, not, wait, wait, that's wait, wait, like you guys just debate. took over the country. Wait, wait, you gotta let me answer the question. I'm not trying to have a debate. I'm trying, I'm trying to, I'm, uh, okay. When you say stacking the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is stacked now. It was already stacked. There's no magic about the number nine. The Supreme Court has had different numbers of Supreme Court members over the years. Nine is not a magic number. It's not a stacking just because Democrats are getting control of a court, which has shown that it will overturn legislation done by the, uh, by the legislature. The, the Supreme Court ain't supposed to be the legislature. And this Supreme Court has come up with all kinds of brand, uh, novel arguments for overturning things that had a precedent of, of more than a century. I'll give you a, a, a recent example. In 1905, the Supreme Court said the government could mandate uh, vaccines. It said that in 1905. Just this year, even though the occupational uh, uh, safety and health uh, 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 OSHA, it has health right in there in the name, uh, said, well, we, got, we want to make the workplace safe, uh, safer for work from COVID-19, they say, oh, that, that's, that's beyond your powers. So they basically are rewriting the law. For Democrats to let them do that is to say that the Supreme Court is more important than the voters. I don't agree with that. I don't, I don't consider Democrats taking control of the uh, Supreme Court by countering. They're not starting a stacking. Stacking's already been done. It's called Merrick Garland. It's called Amy, Cole, Amy Coney Barrett. It's or, the stacking has already occurred. By countering the Republican stacking, you're giving the voters back the power. That's all they're doing. Because what the Democrats are passing is what Democrats would pass in legislation it would only be what people would vote for. It doesn't guarantee that Democrats would win the House or the Senate. It just guarantees that uh, John Roberts doesn't get to rewrite the legislation they pass. So I disagree with your characterization of putting four more people in the Supreme Court. Now, you talk about the other things, the Senate. It, 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 it's authoritarian for Washington, D.C. to have two senators, really? American citizens who pay taxes just like everybody else? North Dakota has two senators. South Dakota has two senators. Why wouldn't the good people of Washington, D.C. deserve to have two senators also? How is that authoritarian? To put them on the same level as the people of South Dakota. That's authoritarian. So again, but, here, but here's the main thing that I disagree with your characterization. Democrats don't dare do any of these things, but they should. They absolutely should do these things to defend democracy. And none of those things I described was anti-democratic. You cannot argue that the Senate is democratic when the state of North Dakota has the same representation as California, but then say it's undemocratic if the people of Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico get to play in the same game. That doesn't make sense to call that as an attack on democracy, because the Senate is inherently undemocratic in its organization anyway. And as far as the Supreme Court, no, six people in robes don't get to overturn what 181 million people vote for. I'm sorry, I believe in democracy. The attack on democracy does not come from the 181 million voters, it comes from the six people in the robes. They're the attack on democracy. So you, you, you're, you're kind of twisting the fix to protect democracy and you're calling that the attack on democracy because Republicans would be a little less likely to win all the elections. There's nothing in those provisions that would stop Republicans from winning a majority of the voters. There's nothing that would stop them from winning the Senate. There's nothing that would stop them from winning the House of Representatives. 
House of Representatives or winning the presidency. Uh, democracy would not be attacked by any of those provisions. And if you think it would, you got to explain how. Okay, okay. now you're gonna- I'll, I'll tell you how. Okay. So, so right now, what is it? Conservative versus right. uh, liberal on the Supreme Court is like uh, three to two. Is that no, kind of the deal? Well, you okay? If, if you reduce it to it, yeah. If you reduce the fraction, yeah, that's what it is. It's six to so three. There, there's six right. people, six. so you want to add? You want to add <laughs> another four? And that'll basically guarantee that the liberals will control the Supreme Court rulings for the next fifty years. And, and as opposed so to the if, if the if the next election goes to the Supreme Court, like the Al Gore election did, then it would be the Democratic, democratically appointed or the Democrat appointed Supreme Court justices that would decide that election. I mean, basically, you're talking about establishing a one party state. I no, mean, so no, no, that, that, that absolutely so I, I, have, not, I have one more. I have one more question. Go ahead. So, it would not be a one party state. We're going to have a one party state, but it ain't going to be run by the Democrats. But go ahead. We already have a one party state. It's run by the Democrats and Republicans. Um, so, so you say well, that, um, yeah. I'd, like to, I'd like to know, like, because what I'm hearing is it doesn't matter what the Democratic Party does. You're gonna vote for them anyway. You're gonna encourage your friends to vote for them. You're gonna, it, this is a life or death matter. So why would the Democratic Party try to accommodate you? They don't have to. You're gonna vote for them regardless of what they do. So who cares? Say whatever well, you want. Why should the well, Democratic Party care about you? You're going to well, vote for well, them anyway. No, the, the Democratic Party is a little more complex than what you're describing. It has lots of different people in it, lots of different ideas. There's a difference between Bernie Sanders and, and, and none and, of whom and, the and, DNC the cares about. Bernie's, the DNC me, doesn't that, care. They don't care. Well, 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 right. well I, I, I don't know what care means. I'm not trying to get Let's to care. Let's get this part wrapped up because we have more questions coming. I'm, I'm interested in using the political party to achieve something. Let me give you a couple of examples of why it makes a difference if the Democrats win. Um, no, I did a I'm asking security. why the Democratic Party should care about you if you're going to vote for them anyway. Well, well, OK, well, when you say that, the problem with your statement is you assume the Democratic Party is one thing. The Democratic Party is it one is. thing. It's one party. No, it is not. It's run I'm by the, the DNC. Democratic Party. <laughs> I'm the Democrat. The Democratic Party ain't the DNC. The Democratic oh, Party. Oh, yes, is it is. Eight. They're the ones who it pick your candidates. We disagree on that. We disagree. For me, the Democratic Party is 181 million people who voted for the Democratic Party. It is not the DNC. The DNC is just a small group of people who have administration of the D Democratic Party at this moment in time. The Democratic Party is the people. And that's why I believe in the Democratic Party, because you you need see American politics. Well, the Democrats, like, Democratic Party don't believe in you. Let me, let me, let me mean, finish, like they let me couldn't care less. That's why well, they're well, not doing it. Well, I'm not trying to get all careful. Right, all right. It's a tool. It's a tool. OK, we, I think you misunderstand the nature of American political parties. But right. here's the deal. Let me let me explain why I say that in America. Again, if you're interested in achieving control of the government, you need a political party. Our system, because of the structure of our constitution, this is not a plan, this is an inadvertent <laughs> result of the way the constitution is written, we end up with a two-party system. That's We're true. going to have two parties. It has nothing to do with, with the constitution. The, it has to do with the two parties has, making sure nobody else can compete. It has, it has right, right, right. Guys, guys, we got to move on to the next Go question, ahead. okay? Okay, all right, that's all right, Brian. Thanks for your your comments and everything. I know we can get into this a little later on. Ernie, you got the next question, so please go ahead. Yeah, um, I don't certainly don't always and often agree with with Brian, but uh, in one sense I do. I agree with Ralph Nader, who once said that uh, what we have in this country is is one party with two heads. And uh, I, I think that there's, there's a lot to that. There's an awful lot of, of uh, um, give me a second here. Uh, there, you know, it, it doesn't often make it quite as much difference as it should. Who's, who's in power? I've uh, uh, favored the notion of more of a parliamentary system where you have many parties that have some Representative representation in the legislature and then uh, uh, vote for a prime minister. And the reason uh, I've for years looked for an explanation of why we have 
a two-party system in this country and why third parties very seldom do well. They'll occasionally make a little splash here and there with a certain candidate, but they really never make a big difference. And David Ramsey Steele, who has spoken to this group before, uh, said, well, it is, it is almost a rule that if you have a direct election uh, of uh, the president, there will be only two parties. It will, it will eventually form down to two parties and, and, and not more than that. By direct election, I mean, uh, obviously we have the College of Complexes, but it, it's not electing people who then elect the president. Um, so, uh, and other people have expressed, in fact, I, I think somebody expressed this evening that we should have more parties. Uh, Greens, Libertarians, uh, Socialists, uh, the Republican Party really should be in two party, in at least two parties now, the Trumps and everybody else, you know, that really believe in Republican values, not just Donald Trump. But I'd like to hear your opinion on that, Kenneth, the the notion of get having more parties and how we can have that come about. Ernie, uh, I, I want to really thank you for that question. Uh, uh, when, when I uh, when I was uh, speaking to Brian previously, I made the statement that the Constitution inadvertently created a two party system. And uh, let me explain what I mean by that. The reason why I think the Constitution inadvertently creates a two party system is because in our country, uh, unlike a parliamentary system, which is based on the popular vote, and then you allocate representation in the parliament based on how many votes, the popular, how much you got of the popular vote. So if you were in a country with a parliamentary system, let's say Italy or some country like that, and let's say 20% of the people were socialists and they vote, well then that socialist party would get 20% of the seats in the parliament, right? So basically it would work like that. In America, Let's imagine that 20% of the people are socialists. And now let's also imagine that they are equally spread out through all the congressional districts in the country. How many socialists would be elected? Let's say they, they get 20% of the vote. How many, how, many, how many members in the House of Representatives would they get? Zero. Zero. So the, the Constitution ties the electoral system to geography. Geography overwhelms population in the American system. Because of that, you can't be a 20% party. It's not worth your time in America because you don't get the return. If you're in a parliamentary system and you get 20% of the vote, you, you feel pretty good. Hey, we got 20% of the folks in the parliament. We're doing something. We're making progress. If you're an American third party and you get 20% of the vote and you get no seats in Congress, well, then you, you can't be you're not viable, you're not tenable because you're not, in order to be that third party, even if you were only getting 20% of the vote, you would have to spend money that would be comparable to the kind of money the Democrats or the Republicans spend. And you would have to get people's hopes up and all this. You're not gonna be able to keep doing that election after election. And so what you end up in the American system because of this structure in the constitution, Remember, the founding fathers didn't plan for any political parties at all. They didn't believe in political parties. I'm not saying this is a plan. I'm saying the way they wrote it has this as a side effect. You end up with two parties because in order to be competitive as a political party in America, you have to be huge. The yeah. party has yeah. to be gigantic to have a chance. Because yeah. remember, yeah. not only do you have to be big enough to have a chance of winning a majority of the seats in the 435 House of Representatives, you got you got to run candidates in thousands of of legislative seats all over the country, right? Because if you can't compete at the state level. Eventually, you won't be able to compete at the congressional level either because of gerrymandering and that sort of thing. You have to be a player at the state level, at the federal level, and there are literally thousands and thousands of seats. Then we have all this money in the politics, right? Again, it requires a giantism in American political uh, structures just to be competitive. If you don't have a chance to win 50% plus one in the election, you're not a player in American politics. And the, in, in American history, 
the, the maximum number of political parties that had a realistic chance of winning 50% plus one in any given election is two. You're never going to have a situation where there's going to be three parties that all simultaneously have a realistic chance of winning 50% of the vote. You never have, you never will under this structure. We would have to modify the constitution to have the kind of parliamentary options you're talking about. Now, third parties are great for raising issues. Uh, they're great for being a, 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 a thorn in the side of the major parties, for forcing them to address things they're not talking about. Sometimes they can uh, tip the balance in an election. They can do all that. They can act as a spoiler, but they're not real competitors with the Democrats or the Republicans. Now, here's the other thing. The way, the, uh, or the, to summarize uh, this phenomenon, the way I like to say it is a real simple phrase. You can't park three cars in a two-car garage, okay? The American political system is a two-car garage. You, it's not visible. Some people will not even agree with it, but it's a two-car garage. You can't park three cars in it. Now, it ain't got to be these two cars. Could you replace the Democratic Party? You could. Could you replace the Republican Party? You could. But the effort to replace either one of those parties would be so great that particularly for people who are, whose politics is left of center, it wouldn't be worth it. Because while you're spending all that time trying to replace the Democratic Party, the Republican Party will monopolize party power and it will make even more damage while you're doing that. The Democratic Party to me is a structure, it's a tool. It's not that I love the Democrats and it's not that I think they care what I want. I don't care. They don't care what I want. I don't care what they want. They're a tool. I, just like I don't care about an automobile. I get in it, I turn the key and I drive. It's a tool. <laughs> and so we have to think of it that way. And all of us who are not who are not content with the Republican Party, if we want a different political force to take power, it's going to be the Democratic Party. Does the Democratic Party need have to behave the way it behaves now? No, it doesn't. The Democratic Party of today ain't the Democratic Party of Franklin Roosevelt. It's not even the Democratic Party of Lyndon Johnson, right? This party has behaved different ways at different times. And how it's going to behave is up to what the voters decide to do. It depends upon how we organize, how much pressure we put on them. There are ways to change this party. And we're going to have to change this party because if we don't, we're, we're just surrendering to what this other party is doing, which is even more horrific. Okay. Can I follow that? Can I follow that up? Then uh, a parliamentary system then would would may solve part of the problem when you've got a case like West Virginia. I understand why Joe, um, uh, his name slips my Manchin. mind. Now. Mansion uh, behaves the way he does because a lot of his voters want him to behave that way. A lot of people who who call themselves Democrats uh, represent constituencies that are more conservative not necessarily totally republican but they're more conservative and and if they want to get reelected and they do want to get reelected because uh, you know they can't do anything if they don't um you know they're 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 following their constituencies and and a lot of liberals and i suppose republicans on the other side are impatient uh with their legislators for sometimes trying to uh, to move toward the center. But now what kind of a system then do they have in Britain? In Britain, they... Uh, parliamentary. Well, yes, except they vote... Uh, 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 does the parliament not then vote for the prime minister? Uh, yeah, yeah, they do that. They do, but they, but they do then, that. then if, if uh, there are certain... Question. There's, there's, there are areas... Well, this is a question. How, how, how is that the same as what you described for Italy? If, uh, yeah, if, I, if people I, I, are voting I, I, conservative or labor and uh, maybe the, you know, the, the, the balance in, in the House of Commons might not represent the balance in the country. Uh, you may know more about the, uh, the electoral system of Britain than I do. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to describe all political systems okay. at all times. I'm, I'm really focused on the American political system okay. because, unfortunately, this is the one we're stuck with. In order yeah. for us to, ha to have a system that's even as the democratic as the system of the United Kingdom in our country would require significant changes to our Constitution. Yeah. For example, 
they only deal with the House of Commons. They have this House of Lords, but it doesn't really have any power anymore. But the yeah. U.S. Senate has tremendous power. power. And, <laughs> and, 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 and it only takes about 20% of the American population to elect enough senators to control the Senate. That is absurd. Mm -hmm. But so we we need we are in need of significant constitutional change, but that's that's risky and that's difficult. It, it's 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 incredibly difficult to change the U.S. Constitution. Yep. 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 Okay. Well, thank you. Sure. Thanks. I'll have other questions if there's time, but I don't know if there will be. Ellen Corley, Hello. you're next. You got two open windows open. Ellen, uh, unmute. Yeah, and, uh, Luke is going to talk. And then yeah, talk. Um, my name's Luke Matthews. I'm up here in Chicago with Ellen Corley. Uh, thank you, uh, Kenneth. I, I didn't listen to uh, everything you said. I got here late as usual, but um, you're obviously a very articulate, well spoken, um, uh, uh, very good communicator. So, um, but I have a, a, a question. Um, which is actually a question, which by definition is a request for information. Uh, so it's, I think it's pretty simple. Um, I, I really uh, don't know the particulars of the John Lewis, I believe it is, Voting Act uh, legislation that the Democrats want to pass and the Republicans are totally opposed to. My question is simply this. What would be, if you could, if you, if, if you know the answer, the main three points of contention between the Democrats and Republicans as the legislation is now written? What are, what would be the top three, would you say? Okay, 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 okay. Now, now this is going to sound a little, a little facetious in my answer, and I'm not trying to be flippant, but the main point of contention is, from the Republican point of view, if it's easy for people to vote, they ain't with it. That's basically it. So anything that makes it easier for people to vote, they're going to oppose it, right? If I may and interrupt, that, go ahead. If I may interrupt, just real quick, I understand that, but I'm I'm asking really the specifics of the bill. Okay, I I, I know. Okay, now the John Lewis Voting Rights Act it would restore preclearance in the 2013 Holder decision, right? Hold Hold versus Shelby. They, uh, the Supreme Court said that the preclearance that was set up in the 1965 Voting Rights Act, this is when if states wanted to make some change to the voting rules, they have to check with the Justice Department and make sure that it's not some violation of the Voting Rights Act. And under preclearance, literally more than 3,000 changes that, that states that were under the old preclearance rules wanted to do were stopped by the Justice Department or by the courts from 1965 to 2013. So they, so they got rid of preclearance and the, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, it, the main point of it is to restore preclearance. Now, Great. some of the Great. other, so, go ahead. What would be number two? What would be number two? Okay, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this, this next thing I'm gonna say, I think is in the Freedom to Vote Act, it would allow no excuse uh, uh, vote by mail in all the states. It would require at least two weeks of early voting in all the states. All the states don't do early voting. For example, New York State doesn't have early voting right now. And, and, uh, and this would be a federal law that every, everybody every, across the country, you'd have two pre weeks prior to the election. For early vote. Two weeks, yeah, you would have two. Uh, two okay, right, two weeks that's number voting. two. What would be number three? No excuse, mail, uh, vote by mail, which would be incredibly powerful. Let me let me tell you why. Yeah. You hit now. Funny thing about mail in voting. Mail in voting started during the Civil War, right? We've been doing mail in voting that long, and mail in voting used to be something that. Republicans did more than Democrats. Prior to the 2020 election cycle, I don't think you can find anything where Republicans are complaining about mail-in voting. The constituencies that favored Republicans, which were senior citizens, uh, uh, active duty military people, uh, 
these these were the constituency using mail-in voting, except for certain states where, where they were letting everybody do mail-in voting places like, our, I guess, Hawaii and, and some other states like that. But but in the, but in the states where Republicans are, are, are running things, they weren't complaining about mail-in voting. All of a sudden, there was COVID, and they passed, they changed some rules to make mail-in voting easier, and Republicans are horrified. Now, this is really important. The reason why Republicans are angry about Democrats using mail-in voting is because mail-in voting negates most of the strategies that Republicans use for voting suppression. If you do voter suppression, what do you do? You close the polling locations in the Black neighborhood, right? You, you, you reduce the hours. You, 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 don't, you have machines that, that where the electricity doesn't really work right in the machine. You, you do all kinds of things. You don't have enough uh, election workers. And down in Georgia, you arrest people if they get a bottle of water while they're in line. Okay, I get it. I, 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 get the, I get the third one, mail on. I, I, I respect you, Kenneth. Uh, you're a, a subject matter expert. You really do know what this bill is about, and you explained it very, uh, very well. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I know, Ellen, you had two windows open. I'm going to allow you an opportunity to ask a question. Okay. But um, then uh, we're going to move on. Make it quick, though, please, because we got Charlie hi. and then we got Jay. Yeah. Right, right. Hey, hey, Kenneth. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I always like what you say. And um, I struggled to come up with a you know, which question to ask, but, uh, you know, I, here's the one that occurs to me now is this, I have a article here about the idea that there was an international law, common law court of justice in January found that the, that 70 leaders of the pharmaceuticals, government, church, um, should be arrested, um, by common law, international law. So I guess, you know, my thought is if we could come up, you know, get rid of these guys for corruption. I'm not sure what, I read somewhere that if, you know, the Justice Department, the CIA hadn't agreed not to investigate themselves, all the Republicans would be arrested and put in jail. I don't know if you know what that is, but I, I mean, I know they were Iran Contra, CIA, making the agreement not to investigate their own crimes, um, you know, or give unitary executive power to, to Trump and put in a platform that just says, we're, we don't even have to have a platform anymore where they used to. Uh, I guess so, you know, thinking as, a, as I think you'd be, you're a great political strategist. We should have a, you know, an ad agency, um, you know, lobbying for camp for these guys. But, uh, you know, if we could like wag the dog by coming up with an issue that really does put all these guys in jail. What do you got any ideas for that? <laughs> well, well, I have, a, I, I think we have a, an idea right now. Uh, Merrick Garland, do your job. Uh, that's, that's, I mean, there is, there is uh, quite a bit of evidence, at least uh, according to what I see in news reports, uh, about the attempted coup uh, that, that they were trying to engineer after Trump lost the 2020 election. Um, I, I don't, you know, for example, there, there are people who actually uh, wrote up uh, certificates saying that they were electors, uh, electors being the people who go to the electoral college to uh, to cast ballots in favor of a, of a candidate who won the election, and there were people in uh, seven states who forged who forged certificates saying they were electors where they were not electors so in places like Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania and Georgia. They uh, they they just they just made up certificates, and they they were so bold that they sent the certificates, they, they mailed the certificates to the uh, National Archives, which is apparently required by the law. If you have real certificates, you're supposed to mail them to the National Archives. So they mailed their phony certificates to the National Archives and they were trying to get Vice President Pence to count those certificates 
instead of the certificates for the uh, Biden Biden's electors who actually won the election and which were certified in the Electoral College on December 14th. On January 6th, that was part of what the coup was playing. That's that's how they were going to do it. And um, if they if Biden if, if if Pence had gone along with it, uh, they might very well have succeeded. Right. right. So the the thing is, could we, you know, there's actually a woman that's in the Justice Department is from Chicago. She wrote an honest paper for the Department of Justice about Burge and all of this. I think we need to get in front of her and say, listen, we're going to help okay. you write this prosecution, a civil rights division prosecution. I, I think she probably feels all alone and intimidated by the culture. But I think we could help her with this approaching this as a criminal administrative law. And they're not allowed to hide crimes by calling them classified or redacted. I mean, we need to get the FOIA reports and we need to write up this prosecution. Citizens arrest, okay, Ellen, which let's, is what let's, uh... this thing talks about. International law, they, they're acting, okay. they've got this smug thing that they're above the law. Ellen, and no let's say this for the rebuttals, enforced. okay? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, and thank you for talking. Um, I'm going to let Charlie go next, and then Jake's got a question. Our caller, Jake. So, yeah, uh, again, it's a, uh, there seems to be a basic assertion in your presentation that the Republicans are a perfect party, and they are anything but that. They lost the election, uh, and their deep division there, they're just barely held in together uh with this allegiance to trump if i ask you to give a talk what do the should the republicans do what would you say well it depends on what the premise of uh of what we were talking about right uh what i was talking about was what the democrats need to do to save democracy uh republicans uh don't appear to be as a party don't seem to be really interested in democracy right now. They seem to be interested in just gaining power. And wait, wait it, it, they're just desperate. They're desperate to hold on. They're not in power. They're this is like stop. This is like emergency actions. All they have left. Well, well, well. You know, I, I don't disagree with you on one level, Charles. There is a desperation. <clears throat> the desperation has to do with the fact. You know, in the last eight presidential elections, Republicans have lost the popular vote in seven out of eight elections. Now, what is that telling you? That's telling you something. That's that's significant. If you keep looking now, Republicans are quick, quick to say, well, the popular vote doesn't count because we use the Electoral College. Well, I guess the Electoral College, you know, because in 2016, they thought the Electoral College was sacred. and They were always telling us the popular vote didn't count. 2020, they're now saying the Electoral College ain't sacred either. But here's the deal. The fact that they're losing the popular vote is telling them that demographics are going against them. And they are scared. They are terrified by the election of President Obama. They are afraid that they're going to see president after president that looks or behaves something like President Obama. That's not the world they want to live in. They are, they don't, they, they want to take their country back from the kinds of people who are, 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 that, are, that are represented by that image. And again, that was the specific communities that they targeted when they began to claim their big lie. They, they said in those communities, that's where the election was held. Uh, so so there, in that sense, you're right, there's a sense of desperation. But on another level, Republicans are very clear-eyed uh, about what they want and what they want is power. Unlike the Democrats who are kind of, um, the Democrats are kind of, you know, it's not clear if they want power or not. You know, I mean, or Democrats, Democrats, you know, they do mother may I for anything they want to do and they always want to color within the lines. What Republicans do is they, 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 they do a kind of different, kind of approach. They think what's going to give us power, that's what we're going to do. 
And if we have to come up with a rationale or excuse for why we're doing this all of a sudden, even though we never did it before, that's what we'll do. That's how the Republican Party is operating. The Democrats are kind of, um, they're squeamish about doing anything. Remember, this is a party that you can't get them to change the filibuster, even though the filibuster was changed even this year just to raise the debt ceiling. They even did the raise the filibuster. They changed the filibuster rules on another occasion because Mike Lee had some crazy bill he wanted to argue about. But on the Democratic side, there's a, well, we don't want to upset anybody. And so they're not going to, uh, it, 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 it is something that we have to uh, look at with the Republicans. You think the Republicans are weak, you, you, can, you can frame them as being weak in one way because they don't have as much popular support as even the Democrats. The Democrats kind of seem pretty politically incompetent and that's kind of a fair criticism of them. But even so, more people vote for them. Again, they won seven out of the eight of the, la of the popular vote at the presidential level. There are more people supporting the Democrats, but Republicans are focused like a laser beam on how to take power anyway. And they are creating a system where they can have minority rule, where even if they lose election, well, even if they, even though they keep losing the popular vote, they will still have power. You asked me about those, uh, 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 someone asked me about the, those laws that the, uh, I was saying the Democrats should pass. Another important aspect of the Freedom to Vote Act is it would get rid of gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is one of the most powerful aspects Republicans use to gain minority power. In, in the state of Wisconsin, Democrats actually have more votes uh, for the state legislators across the state than Republicans do. Republicans have a super majority in the legislature. That's the power of gerrymandering. You can turn an even vote, a 50-50 vote, or even a vote where you kind of lose into a significant majority and, and in the legislature through gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. And Republicans are very adept at that. And they're very uh, aggressive about doing that. So the thing you have to think about the Democrat, uh, the Republicans, if you're if you're worried about them being out of power and we, you have to remember time is passing, and uh, we're in 2022. The election is going to be in November of this year, and you know we, we may look back at this conversation a year from now, and Republicans may be in charge of everything but the White House. Okay, since. <laughs> All right, now, uh, Charlie, did you get your question answered? Okay, uh, Jake, you're next. Go ahead and unmute. Um, I'll un Jake, our caller. Jake, are you there? You're ready to go. If not, I'll have uh, Janice Glintzer go. Jake, are you there? Okay, Jake, you put your hand up. You're looking for a question. You're not there now. All right, Janice, your guest, you're next. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, I'm okay. unmuted. I'm unmuted. All right, I'm all unmuted. Right. All right, Jake. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Uh, sorry, I missed, sorry, I missed the beginning. Tell me your name and affiliation again. Oh yeah, uh, uh, my name is Kenneth Williams. I did a presentation about uh, are, are Democrats doing enough to defend democracy? Oh, okay. All right. Pro probably not. Um, um, what? 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 Uh, got a couple of questions. Um, um, but I mean, are you affiliated with any any particular political group? Well, I mean, uh, I, I'm I'm a member of a number of groups that okay. I right. work with right. down in okay. Texas. Okay. Yeah. So okay. All right. Uh, I mean, m much of this I've heard before. Um, yeah. I mean, in in the case in case of uh, what's his name? Um, um, uh, uh, who who is a Democrat from West Virginia? What's his name? Joe Manchin. Um, Joe, Joe, Manchin. Joe Slum Joe Slumlord, I call him. But okay, um, he's he's just he's just react he's just reacting to the political situation in his in his state. But anyway, um, uh, what was going to ask here? A uh, couple of questions. Um, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think would be the best way to resolve the? Uh, Fragmentation, shall I uh, shall call it, within the Democratic Party, and um, 
what, what's and, and and how how do we get past this this this? I mean, how do we get past this whole um uh um yeah? I mean, how do we, how do we get past the the mess that we're in politically? Uh, you, uh, you, uh, you, there was interesting. There was interesting what you said before that in the past um, Republicans favored mail on mail on ballots because they they benefited from it. Right. But yeah. Um, Right. Well, Jake, uh, I I, uh, I don't believe there's a, a any quick way past the mess that we're in. I think the mess is significant enough and complicated enough. It's not going to be a, it's not going to be a quick fix of this. It's going to be something that people will have to be able to they'll have to be willing to work on it for a really long time. Uh, I think you can win a victory, but you're not going to win it. You're not going to win it in a day. You're not going to win it in one election. You're going to have to see right now. We all know that the Democratic Party, as it is, has uh, a lot of corrupt elements in it. There's money in it. It's uh, there's a lot of people in it who are, who are not really working for the people there. They're working for their donors. We We all know that. Right. But you can't, you're not going to, you know, snap the fingers and that's going to go away. We're going to have to actually work in order to get different kinds of people in, in control of that party. There are people in that party who I think sincerely are working for people and there are people who are not. And we're going to have to change the ratio. We, we, need, to get, we need to get more people in that party who actually are going to work and fight for ordinary people and have fewer people in there who are going to be working for the uh, big money donors. And that's, and that's going to be uh, a grinding political process. We're going, to have to, we're going to have to be determined to keep fighting for it for a long time. And uh, right. that's the only way. Uh, they, right. Nobody's going to hand it to us. The people, the people from up, up top in the Democratic Party aren't going to fix it. They're not going to, right. it's, going to ha- it's going to have to come from the bottom up. Ordinary right. people from the ground up can change that party, right? right? Because in the end of the day, I don't care how much dollars they have, it's the people in the end who will be able to determine the fate of the Democratic Party if they decide to right. do it. Right. If we, and if we work right. at it long enough and fight at it long enough, that's what we have to do. Right. The alternative um, one, one. Yeah. Is, to, you know, is to live in uh, Trump world. Yeah, right. The the other the other the other question I would have is what's the relationship between the Democratic Party and the and the unions? It used to be it used to be that um for example, fifty years ago, um where did Hubert Humphrey come come out of? He came from the the Minnesota Democratic uh it was called the Demo, the Minnesota Democratic Labor uh Demo, the Minnesota Democratic Farmer Labor Party is what it was called. Now most of those same people have drifted over to the Republican Party. What's what's happened there? Well, I think what happened is uh, if you go back, say, sixty years or seventy years, about thirty percent of the American people were, were in labor unions, and uh, yeah. and then uh, in the Reagan era, uh, labor unions were attacked. And the percentage of people who were in labor unions were busted. Uh, we had uh, uh, companies move from northern uh, places that were unionized down to southern right-to-work uh, states. Uh, there was automation, and then and then finally they offshore jobs and ship jobs overseas. All of these things, all these things, uh, significantly reduced the percentage of the population. That uh, it was uh, that that are parts of labor unions. Now it's something like <laughs> nine or ten percent, and um, and and then we had a whole political narrative that said unions are just uh, something that's inflationary that just uh, uh, hurts businesses, and uh, and and all we need is to have the uh, corporations be able to do whatever they want, and then somehow the money would trickle down. That's the story. Yeah. No. It's mostly yeah, yeah. it's mostly it's mostly coming from Republicans. I guess what I'm I guess what I'm asking. I guess right. what I'm asking. Guess I guess what I'm asking is why well, why, why isn't you, it, 
Wait, wait, wait. Well, okay, I guess when, what I'm when asking. The, when, when, when the unions, when the unions shrunk, when the unions yeah. got smaller in size, right. uh, there was a faction of Democrats called the Democratic Leadership Council, uh, right. led by people like Bill Clinton and Al Gore, who decided that the way Democrats would raise funds, because Democrats used to be very much dependent upon the labor movement for its funding, right. and they would right. get their funds from the corporations, and they would somehow find the you know the nice corporations to get money from, and yeah. and they would get money. I don't from. think I don't think there was a conscious decision. It was more it was more an instrument of what happened when the PAC system came came on board. Just the cost cost of of cost of uh, campaigning went up and up and up. Okay. Well, it did, but there was a conscious decision too. They they. The, uh, the Democratic Leadership Council Democrats were wanted to uh, present themselves to business as business friendly Democrats in contrast to some of the uh, more progressive Democrats. That was part of the way they were packaging themselves. You don't have to be. You don't have to be anti. You don't have to be anti. You don't have to be anti business in order to be pro union. Okay. Uh, Jake, no. Gonna... No. I'm. I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying. I'm saying. I'm. I'm, I'm telling you. The, the way the, the the way the Clinton version of the Democratic Party was trying to frame itself. Okay, listen, guys, uh, Jake. I know you've been engaged in a while, but we got other questioners. I'd like to get on to Janice if you don't mind. Okay, okay. and thank thank you, Jake, for participating tonight. Janice, your other okay. question is yours next. Uh, thank you. Go ahead, Janice. Um, if it's impossible to get the money out of politics, my question is. What about having a law that says all candidates must singularly or only use publicly funded money? Oh, uh, hi, Jen. You know, that three dollars uh, uh, during uh, when we do our taxes. Th th thanks for your thanks for your question. I, I don't agree that it's impossible to get money out of politics. I, it's difficult, but it's not. I don't think it's impossible. Uh, but if, if we talk about the thing you're talking about, saying you're going to have a law saying you can only use public funds, here, here's the thing, and I've had this discussion with a lot of my progressive friends over the, over the years. You have to understand that the struggle to get money out of politics is going to incur that fight. That fight is, is happening. It's, it's already happening kind of every day. That fight is going to take place in a world where money is still in politics, right? So we don't get money out of politics with the solution. That comes at the end after we've won. When we win, we can make a rule that says you can only take the, the money that's donated from public funds. But as we are fighting against this uh, problem, uh, the folks are still gonna be piling up stacks of money in politics during this whole time. Now, after we win, we can change that rule but we're not, we, can't, we can't start out saying, oh, we have to change the rule before we can do anything else. No, we're going to have to fight on this. Uh, it's not our best ground. It's not the ground we want to fight on. But we're going to have to fight on that ground because that's the way it is. And you don't have the, you don't, you don't have the power to change the law until after you win. So right now, we're not on the winning side of that argument. We're, we're on the right side of that argument morally. But we don't have the power to take money out of politics. There's six to three conservative Republicans on the Supreme Court who think money is speech. And like I was telling uh, a friend earlier, uh, putting other uh, uh, justices on the court ain't stopping democracy. It's stopping plutocracy because those guys on there want the money folks to run the government. And to have a democracy, you got to get them out the way. Well, okay. See, you're only stopping democracy when you stop voters, not when you not when you stop the Supreme Court or something. The Supreme Court ain't the source of democracy in the country. The people are. Okay. All right, um, Jake. Before I go back to yeah. you for I yeah, I, I, I got I got I got I, I got a point. I got, wait, 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 wait. I, I want to answer. I want to answer the question real simply, and that is, we used to have we used to have a public financing system. Guess who ended it? Obama ended it because 
it, 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 uh, re- because it put too many limits on the amount of money that you could raise. And the result is that after he put an end to it, the next election, both the Democrats and Republicans raised about a billion dollars apiece for, for, presidential, for a presidential election. Well, so it, it's, it's Obama, both Obama, both Obama didn't actually, Obama didn't end the, the financing system. He didn't use he, it, but he didn't, yeah. he didn't, Obama's, end it. He, he, didn't he, he, he did not pass a law to say you can't have the system. What, what is ended financial uh, limitations on financial contributions is not Obama. It's the Supreme Court with Citizens United. That was part of it, but I'm saying Obama did something too, and I don't know. No, what, don't Obama, know what Obama rule. did. Well, I can explain yeah. what Obama did. They used to. Oh. Uh, it's not. There's a law. In fact, it's that the law is still there. I, I, nobody really uses it now. That if someone running for president can yeah. get public funding so long as they oh. agree to stay under certain limits, right? Yeah. So right. If, so so they can get public funding if they agree to stay under certain limits. Obama's right. campaign figured out to raise way more money than what those limits were, and so he decided not to stay in those limits. It is not fair to say he ended the system because he didn't stay in those limits, because so the system still. Say, so, so you're saying he just didn't get the he he just didn't he he didn't get the public financing, so he made them move around it. By he made a decision not to use it. He made a decision right, not right, to right, use right. it because right. he could raise more money other ways. Right, 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 right. Okay, so I'm saying, I'm saying, but I'm saying both, right. both, both, both parties are stuck in the same lot. Essentially, what well, I'm saying. Well, well, yeah, I mean, sure, uh, okay, okay, uh, I'm not gonna argue with that. Okay, yeah. I'd like to move on to Bob Matter now, if it's possible. Bob, you got a question? Okay, uh, <clears throat> yeah, Ken. Um, I'm, you know, up here in Chicago, we're all a little dismayed. Why? Any black person would want to vote Democratic. Um, well, uh, I, 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 I want to tell you that I'm a little insulted by the statement, but go ahead. You, you go ahead and make your statement. Uh, actually, 90 percent of black people vote for the Democratic Party. Do you think they would be better off voting for the Republican Party? Wait, 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 wait. You, you raised black people, so I'm a point of uh, a privilege here because you're talking about black people and you don't sound like you're black. But why are why are why are uh, are you suggesting that black people vote for the Republican Party? Oh, uh, yes, of course. Okay, okay. Right, so let, let, let's let so, Bob get so his full question let in. Me, let, let, let me let, let's be clear. The party that that accused African Americans of stealing the election is the party black people should vote for. The party that thinks we steal elections. Pence did uh, come clean yesterday. You know. Well, well, no, we did. We they didn't. They didn't claim that blacks stole the election. Wait, 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 wait! No, 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 sir, no, sir. I have to correct you there. They didn't. They didn't use the word black, but they used the word Wayne County in 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 Michigan. Who lives in Wayne County? Are you familiar with Wayne County? That's where Detroit is. And then, okay, now let's take the map all the way over in Pennsylvania. Wait, 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 finish. They said Philadelphia County. Who lives in Philadelphia County? What, what's your That's question? What's your question? Then they said Milwaukee no, County. County. Let them well, all those Democratic County. No, no. What's your the, question? The, the, I don't understand the question. General, the Attorney General of the state of Texas reached all the way from Texas to accuse those. He wanted to throw the votes of those states. And he wanted to thwart the votes of those states because of those counties. Fulton County in Georgia. Who lives in Fulton County? So if your party claimed that the Democratic Party stole the election in those counties, you are accusing Black people of stealing the election. Now, if a party believes Black people steal election, Black people are supposed to vote for that same party? Is that logical, sir, to you? Well, I, I, let's get away from that election stuff. That wasn't the nature of my question. Okay. I'm saying, All right, let's let uh, Kenneth, Kenneth let let Bob phrase his full question and then don't try under, to get an answer. Uh, All look, right, you know, under under, okay, so um, under uh, Trump, we had uh, stable prices, we had a secure border, blacks had the lowest unemployment rate ever, full and most highest employment ever. 
Um, crime was, you know, under control. Now, since Biden's come in, we've seen inflation go through the roof. People are paying twice as much for gas. Blacks are getting murdered in the streets in New York and Chicago. It's like a slaughter. And, it, and they're killing whites and Asians, too. But, but for, the, for the most part, it's, it's blacks that are dying. And, you know, they, they, they Democrats that run these big cities like in Chicago, they let, they let Black Lives Matter come in here and burn the place down. And uh, now all these stores are closed and everything. So what's your question? Um, what's your question? So why, why, would, uh, why, would, why would black people vote for Democrats uh, and then have to pay higher prices for things, have all this crime going on in their streets, uh, unsecure borders, let, let, let me know higher when you, Let me know when you're through. Let me know when you're through because you're repeating yourself. It, yeah, I mean, do you have a question? Are you going to let me answer the question? Are you going to let me answer the question? Yeah, go ahead. Say this go question. Ahead. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, first of all, uh, the facts that you presented are not facts. I want to stipulate that, first of all. It is not a fact that Black people had the best time of their lives under Donald Trump. That is utter nonsense. That, that's first of all. That's simply not a fact. It's not even a, it's not even a fact that, um, that, 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 or that Black people are having some great crime wave right now. That is also something that simply is historic in historical terms. That's simply not true. Even though the crime rate has gone up in America, it, crime rate didn't go up for Black people. The crime rate has gone up in America in general in recent years. It is not anywhere close to the uh, historical high levels of crime that we had in, say, the early 1990s. We don't have a historically high level of crime in America right now. That is simply not true. That's A. B, then you ask, why would Black people vote for the Democratic Party instead of the Republican Party? There's a couple of reasons. I'll, I'll just, I'm just going to give you uh, what I think are kind of the, the three top reasons why it makes more sense for Black people to vote for the Democratic Party rather than the Republican Party. The Republican Party doesn't really like Black people right now. Now, why do I mean when I say that? A Republican politician can gain political energy by simply making his voters angry about Black people. He can say critical race theory and win an election. A Democratic politician can't do that. Not that a Democratic politician would try to do that. I'm saying your party is, in its own behavior, it behaves as though it's hostile toward African Americans. The phrase Black Lives Matter, which you which you stereotype this as something that burns cities down, that's not true. Uh, uh, it, it is, is, is something that there seems to be just a general hostility toward the very presence of African-Americans on the part of some conservative Republicans right now. That's the first thing. Then from an economics point of view, Republicans oppose raising the minimum wage. The minimum wage, raising the minimum wage would benefit African-Americans. In states controlled by Republicans that have large Black populations who need health care, Republicans refuse to expand uh, Medicaid. And I'll tell you something I heard at a town hall meeting of a Republican congressperson back when President Obama was uh, in office and they were fighting to establish the Affordable Care Act. I heard someone say, again, this was a town hall, uh, most of the people in it were Republicans, he, he called Medicare, uh, the, uh, he called the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, backdoor reparations. So his reason for ex opposing this particular voter, his reason for opposing the Affordable Care Act was so he thought it was somehow kind of a gift to African Americans. Again, this is an attitude that I find among uh, some uh, conservative Republicans, I won't say all Republicans, but these attitudes, the, the sense of hostility toward African Americans doing real economic harm by not raising the minimum wage, not expanding uh, uh, Medicaid in those states like Alabama and Georgia, where uh, in Mississippi, where lots of African-Americans live. Why would you vote for a party that's keeping you from getting health care, doesn't want to raise your wages, and seems to rationalize police violence against unarmed African-American citizens? For example, just, just today, uh, a, a, a young man in... Um, 
in in Minnesota, in in the city of uh, Minneapolis, the police uh, did a no-knock warrant, came in his house, shot him in his bed in the middle of the night, shot him within seconds of coming into the house. Now, this young man had a, a firearm. He was reaching for it to defend himself because he doesn't know what's coming in his house in the middle of the night. Now, most Republicans say there's the Second Amendment and it's so, somehow sacred and it's important and it's a constitutional right. But when this young man uh, uh, was killed by the police, what did we hear from the NRA? What did we hear from most conservative Republicans? Crickets, crickets. There was a young man named Philando Castile. He was driving in a car with his, with his uh, fiance and his child in the backseat he had a, a gun permit. Again, Republicans, white conservative Republicans say they believe there's this second amendment right to have a firearm. He had a, a licensed weapon. He told the police officer he had a weapon and somehow the police officer in, interpreted this as a threat or whatever and shot the man dead. And what did we hear from the NRA, the Republican party, conservative Republicans? Crickets. It sounds like y'all don't really care about the lives of black people. So if you have these, policies that are economically hostile to Black people, you're trying to make it hard for Black people to vote in Georgia and Texas, you're actually going to arrest people for getting a bottle of water, why would we vote for that same party? This is a party that wants to keep Confederate statues up, Stat put statues of people who wanted to keep our people in slavery. Republicans are fighting to maintain those statues. Again, this is a party that identifies with Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis, they don't identify with Abraham Lincoln, even though they say they're the party of Lincoln. Why would, what is the, what, what would really be the advantage either economically, politically or whatever for African-Americans to invest with a party that's visibly hostile to African-Americans and has economic policies that are already harmful to most working class people? It's not, why do black people vote for Democrats? It's why do white people who are not rich vote for the Republicans? Because I'm gonna tell you a secret. They putting their foot in the behinds of working class white people as well. Why are y'all voting for the Republican Party? That is a mystery to me. But hmm. well, that's not a mystery I need to solve. But okay, um, I would like to ask you a question, Kenneth. Um, you know, one of the most I'm going to play real quick one of the most effective political ads I've seen ever. And why aren't you guys in the Democratic Party? doing something like this Damn, this is a question period oh uh, all right i'll go to the rebuttal then but uh there's a really good okay anyway um i can't wait to see it uh tim well if charlie would let me indulge a little bit it's just going to take about a minute and i'd like to get your there's opinion no on other it. question there's no other question is waiting right at this minute so if it's okay with me if it's okay with you guys all right, let's yeah, let's let him, let him do it. Let him do all it. All right, well, well, we'll just be well, it's just going to be a second or two. It's only a minute long, and I want to make sure we can get. I'm going to share my screen here real quick. Many of you will probably know this by just the uh, thing here, real quick. You may you may have seen this. Oh yeah, I seen yeah yeah. I, I'm old enough to remember this commercial. Yeah. What is it? You're showing that. I can't believe I, that, that, most of you um, folks look, look, look most of y'all look old enough to remember this commercial. I'm surprised. What's it's the a commercial? commercial from 68 against It's the, from 1964. Nuclear. It's from the 1964 campaign. Lyndon Johnson did this commercial yeah. against uh, Barry Goldwater. Barry oh, Goldwater was oh, oh, to be to a maniac with, who was uh, going to take with us this, to nuclear the war. Discussion. It's got a lot to do with it. He was, he was, he was, oh, oh, this is the this is the ad where this is the ad where he this is this is the ad where, where Lyndon Johnson accuses uh, Barry Goldwater of wanting to wanting to nuke Vietnam, right? I remember that. Okay. Yeah. Well the thing that okay, I'm gonna to I'm gonna stop to my write. screen now. My question is do you have anything in the pipeline that might uh, what did you think of the ad and do you think you'll have anything just as effective to stop the Republican onslaught. Okay. Okay, one <laughs> thing I wanted to say, I, I think a lot about the Democratic Party and I analyze it, but I ain't gotten, I don't have any power in the Democratic Party. I, I can't, 
I'm, my power in the Democratic Party is just like yours. I'm, I'm a voter, I'm an activist, but I, I can't make the Democratic Party do anything. Now, what do I think? Should the Democratic Party be formulating a message? Yes. yes. Absolutely. And uh, they need to form a message that focuses on economic issues, on why it's the benefit of other people, uh, the benefit of most people for the, the follow the policies favored by the Democrats. But they also need to be taking on this threat to democracy. And the threat to democracy is a is a threat to ordinary people. It's not going to be obvious to everybody. You know, people who think about politics a lot like some of us do are going to see it right away. But a lot of folks are just living their lives going around. They don't think, you know, they they think it's all a bunch of BS. Two parties are the same. It doesn't make any difference. But what's going to happen is there are going to be different consequences in terms of your access to health care, your wages, the security of your retirement. All these things are going to change for the worse if Republicans seize uh, power in a system where you can't really easily vote them out. And uh, climate change is, is, is here, and it's going to be having more and more impact on people as we're going along. And as climate change has more impact, it's going to see the conservatives have been brilliant in, in, in brainwashing people into thinking that there's a choice between spending a lot of money on fighting climate change under some kind of Green New Deal or saving money and just doing business as usual. That ain't the real choice. It's a choice between spending some money to fight against climate change now or spending a whole lot more money later on if you don't do something to control climate change. That's the real economic comparison. Not fighting climate change is going to cost way more money than any. You can't give me a plan, a Green New Deal plan or any other plan that can cost as much as not doing something to prevent climate change. Now, when this happens and, this, and, and we're moving toward that, those costs are going to be paid by you. And when I say by you, I mean people whose houses get flooded out. If, the, if it's up to the Republicans, that individual family will absorb the costs. In some cases, they might make the taxpayers pay for it. But what they ain't going to do is they ain't going to make the Koch brothers pay for it. They ain't going to make ExxonMobil pay for it, right? And so the cost is going to be paid by all of us. And that is one of the most devastating things that's going to happen as a result of Republican control, not to mention them trying to ban abortions, uh, trying to stick even more people in the prison system, trying to uh, deport more uh, undocumented immigrants. They're going to do all that and there's going to be more violence. But, but, they, are, but, they, are, but they are also going to really damage the whole economy long term by their insistence that climate change is a hoax. We're going to pay for that. All right. We got Brian Dehenny. Uh, we'll make this our last question and then we'll go to rebuttals because it is getting to be 838. It's been a very <laughs> spirited night. Uh, Brian, go ahead. Unmute, Brian. I, I said I, I have more of a rebuttal than a question. Well, so then I'll, I'll what we'll do then is why don't we... Uh, Go into rebuttal. So I'll give everybody four minutes. Who wants to rebut? Yeah, I get, I get, I get another quick question. Can you give us uh, your contact? Can you give us your contact information? Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll put my email address in the chat. Uh, okay. He's on the right. Okay. I'm on. I'm on. I'm on the phone. Here. All right. So yeah. we got rebuttals now. But you'll be able to get it from somebody else then, who is uh, right. Okay. Don't, All right. don't worry. Okay. 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 All right, okay, so we got right. Brian Dehenny. Who else has a rebuttal? Charlie, I know you got one. Uh, Bob, you want one? Okay, Margaret. I right, go Brian, then one? Margaret. I want one. Who who was that? Ellen. 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 Ellen Corley. Okay. All right. Okay, I got Brian, Margaret, Ellen Corley. Um, who else? Bob Matter. Okay, who else? Okay, so I have Bob Matter, Margaret Aguilar. I got Brian Dehenny, Margaret Aguilar, Brian Corley, Bob Matter. Charlie, do you want to go too? And Charlie Paydock. All right, uh, I'll go with these five first and then uh, 
what we'll do is we'll then start up and uh, just go ahead and uh all right, we, so right now I have Brian DeHenny, Margaret Aguilar, Ellen Corley, Bob Matter, and Charlie Paydock. And then, uh, Kenneth, you get a stick around and you get the last word. Okay. Sure you, what? That yeah. means you get, you'll be the final. Yeah, no, I understand. I, I know the process. Yeah, I'm saying, I just said yes. Okay, just okay. Yes. okay. All right, so, uh, Brian DeHenny, the floor is yours. Four minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I really appreciated your presentation. I understand where you're coming from. I mean, the voice of the people is being drowned out. We're not being represented by the politicians. I, you know, some of these Democratic politicians, I, I like them. I mean, I ran against Kim Fox here in Chicago, and I never criticized her. I mean, I don't have any beefs. Like, she seems to be trying. Um, you know, and some of the Republican politicians, are they're, they're horrendous, you know, and some of them are okay, you know. But what I see in the you know, kind of the long term looking at this, because I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm 51 years old, I've been voting for, you know, over 20 years, I've been paying attention. And every election, it's the same thing, you know, it's the, the, those Republicans, all those Democrats, we got to beat those guys, if we don't beat those guys, and this is everything. And, and all the while that that's happening, our rights are being stripped, people are going broke, um, our healthcare system's failing. We're continuously at war. We're, we're incarcerating people in higher numbers than any country on earth. We have more people in prison than any country on earth. And so I, I can't conceive of any situation in which the Democratic Party is going to change. It's not. I mean, it's been 20 years of this. It's never changed. It's gotten worse. I mean, these these people, Joe, Joe Biden. Holy cow. I can't believe that guy is president. I mean, it's unbelievable to me. And, and then Kamala Harris. I mean, she was the most unpopular candidate that Democrats had. But now there she is. The next. And I mean, these people don't represent you. They don't represent me. I don't know who they represent, but it's not the people. So. You know, I became a libertarian just because I don't know what else to do. I, I mean, it's, it's like, <laughs> what else is there? I mean, the Democrats aren't going to change. They don't have to. People are just going to keep voting for them regardless because they're not Republicans, because Trump. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, the Democratic Party, you know, like they could kill people in the streets and, and they'd get support because Trump. And the Republicans, they could do the same thing. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's just, you know, this polarizing. Un until the point where, I mean, we're, we're legitimately talking about a civil war in this country. And I can't see how either one of the two parties are, are going to, to turn their course because, because the reality is they have no substance. They have no policies. They have no intention of helping anyone but themselves. And the only way to avoid scrutiny is to just constantly accuse the other party of being worse. And that way they can ensure that they're never held accountable for anything. And when we talk about third parties, right? Here at the local level, right? I mean, this is a county in, in, in Chicago, in, in Illinois, right? One county. And the Democratic Party is going out of its way to make sure we can't compete. If you're not an established party, then, your your signature requirements to get on the, the ballot go for like for example right here in cook county if we're an established party we need 60 signatures to get a candidate in the ballot if you're not an established party you need six thousand, right and that's what they do to keep other people off the ballot to keep the political monopoly so i, I don't i i mean you seem like a decent guy, man. I hope someday you'll consider joining the Libertarian Party and, uh, you know, trying to make an actual change because the Democratic Party is that's where dreams go to die. And they are killing this country just like the Republicans are. And if we don't change course, we're done. OK, that will be done. I take it. Correct. Yes. All right, Brian. Margaret, you've got four minutes. Please uh, go ahead and start. Unmute, Margaret. I, it, could I go last? I, I, I'd rather respond to some of the things that the people have said in the re rebuttal periods. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Well, Ellen Corley, you get her up next, and so go ahead. All right. Um, 
thank you, Kenneth. Um, I I think you should run. I I ran. Uh, I've run on the Green Party. I tried to run on the Democratic Party. I thought of running in the Republican Party. I, you know, the idea is we will vote for the moral good person. You know, these issues are they're hard to understand, and I think they've been divided by the it, they've been designed by the lobbyists. And you know, my stepfather dated Betsy McCoy, the evil, you know, conservative. They they write in the conservative magazine, and you know, they've been orchestrating this game. Uh, it's an oppositional research kind of game where, you know, you're you, the Democrats spend money, tax and spend, you know, the crime. I mean, they just manufacture the you know, the false racist image that Bob was referring to, you know, and um, that's neocon. You know, they invented this whole thing. They should be it's a violation of advertising law, marketing law, the media monopoly. Uh, you know, they they deregulated the federal, the FCC fairness doctrine. Before that, it was the Mayflower doctrine, which said that they needed, you know, media belongs to the people. We need to, to know who to vote for. And if that's why they, the media needed to be fair and balanced. There's a great movie, The Second Assassination of um, John F. Kennedy and the media by John uh, Slaughter, um, something like that. And it just, you know, they show Jim Garrison, uh, Johnny Carson saying the CIA did it. You know, that's what we need. We, the media has to be that honest. But um, I, I think one of the key things is I, when I ran for, I learned a lot by running Democrat. They, they said, well, we won't run you. I was Obama organizing for action because we, we have a policy not to challenge anybody who's got a Democratic seat. Well, no wonder you got a lot of bought off all, you know, nobodies there. And so I tried to run for the Green Party. I was on the Green Party. I wrote this thing, all progressive. I mean, I'm just a progressive, honest person, but I said, nothing can happen unless we get rid of, of you know, corruption and this machine, it's a big game. And, um, you know, CIA has created it. It's by foreign influences. And I know from my own experience, it was an ultra Zionism controls both sides, right? And and they're always pointing the finger. I go up to Wisconsin, they go, oh no, that's the Democrats. And I I know from my own experience, the Republicans, they took my stepfather and the whole So the corruption is horrible, but they used that at the precinct level, like 10 people from the fifth district, I could was on the ballot. They said, she's anti-Semitic and threw me off. So I wonder how many people, I suspect every single party at the precinct level, it's being controlled by people that, that get rid of you. You don't even, you know, they don't say you're smart, you're qualified, give you a chance. I think the parties, we need to start it now because I mean, I agree, I voted Obama and Hillary and I, you know, anybody, Kim Fox, you know, don't put in the head of Carlisle, you know, I mean, but it's like how much, you know, it's the least worst choice. And we, there's all this talk about who to vote for, who's on the ballot. I think it ought to be our job. You know, the most qualified person needs to be there. Kenneth, you're the most qualified person I know. And I think you should be on it by, you know, responsibility. You don't even get to choose. Actually, I'm descended from the cousin of Robert E. Lee, his great grandfather. And, you know, I have to say, though, I, I think they're designing this game to make the, this be a red sweep because by throwing out Robert E. Lee, but that's like, I mean, he wasn't a racist, you know, but, and, but so they're using these issues, Black Lives Matter and the vaccines. If we keep, you know, Lori Lightfoot just vaccine mandates forever, you know, I'm like, who's her advising her? Who's advising Biden? It's like, I'm gonna vote just to, you know, I have to move to Georgia to get away from this 
evil democratic machine. When it starts seeming more totalitarian than the red states, they start seeming more libertarian, then that's the way I perceived it when I lived in Georgia. And I would usually just not vote, which is the another part of the problem. I, now I'm gonna go down there and I, but I was thinking of voting for Republican because I wanna infiltrate them right in their face and say, I'm on the ballot, not him. There's a whole lot of, contests that aren't even taken up but you know we need to be out there this is what public education was supposed to do i was a teacher and I, why you know john dewey progressive education and they they now we're just a technocracy they closed the schools down for two years and feed them Microsoft, like you be a programmer, everything's going to be all right. They wonder why we're all starving and there's no unions. You know, we we really got to all be activists, all be running, you know, and, and all be fighting and challenging at every single level, the most corrupt, because we're the, the uncorrupt. It's got to be a moral imperative, you know, um, anyhow, and, and even the, the issues, and we got to get the media fixed first. Okay. I mean, my father, I wrote it, he sends me this conservative, just look at that and, okay. and challenge all of those things all the time. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Ellen. Okay, Bob, you're next. Four minutes. Okay, so um, I guess a democracy, uh, I guess should mean uh, a representative government, you know, uh, doing what the people's work or what the people want. And if you took a poll right now, well, a matter of fact, there are, have been a bunch of polls, but if, I know if you took a poll in Chicago right now, the two issues most uh, the voters are most concerned about is number one, inflation, and number two, crime. But if you look at uh, what's on the list of Democratic talking points coming out of uh, Washington, D.C., uh, they seem to think that uh, our number one uh, issue is, uh, is, uh, is U the Ukraine and, uh, and vaccines. You know, and, uh, and, then, and then global warming or something after that, and then uh, you know, some, other, some other nonsense. Uh, but not really what, what we want. And I guess this is probably why Biden's uh, approval rate is, is so low. And uh, it looks like there's just going to be a massive uh, red wave uh, coming in November. And I, I can't wait. By the way, I heard something funny today <clears throat> that, or yesterday on, on the radio that uh, the U.S. bobsled team has named their sled uh, Biden because nothing has taken Americans downhill faster. That isn't even, that isn't even funny, Bob. I thought that was pretty funny. That's, I didn't that isn't even, even funny. I actually, I actually heard that on the radio. That's what the, the, that the American box left. Well, yeah, well that's, that's, that isn't that's, even that's, funny. I thought it was pretty cute. But uh, anyway, uh, so I'm trying to think what the, uh, you know, if, 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 our, if we, Look at the end game. Uh, what our speakers, you know, what the Democrats are leading us to. Um, you know, you don't have to look far. I mean, look at look at Detroit. Look look at uh, you know Baltimore, and look look at the direction Chicago's going in. These are all Democratic cities. Like for instance, in Illinois, you know, we've got Democratic governor, Democratic congressman, Democratic senator, Democratic mayor. Democratic district attorney, Democratic county commissioner, uh, Democratic chief of police. It's all Democrats going on down the line. <clears throat> and you know what? People are abandoning the city. People won't go there. Right now, I just saw an article today that uh, uh, hotels are, have huge vacancy rates. You know, conferences are, have been canceled. People aren't coming downtown to, to shop and spend time in the weekends. Uh, this, you know, this, this is going to affect tax revenues. So like this crime is really, you know, the crime situation is, is sure. so out of hand, uh, you know, and so this is where we're going. So like what, what I'm trying to think, what is the end game? What, the only thing I can think of that uh, by black people would vote for a Democrat is that they have this end game goal of maybe is, is reparations. Is that, that's what I've been hearing. It's the, the kind of the, the holy grail of what everybody's after. I don't know what they, what, how much they think these reparations are going to be worth. I don't, you know, I don't know, but is, certain, is it worth the high prices we're paying at the pump and, and the grocery store and everything? And, 
you know, on the crime, like uh, last year in Chicago, there were actually over 800 murders. Now they they only report 700 and something because a number of those murders were on the expressway because it's a little loophole because expressways are controlled by the state. Anybody that's killed on an expressway in Chicago is not counted as being murdered in Chicago. So, so they say, oh yeah, murders were 797 or something, but it's really more like 820 or 849. They've had about 46 people murdered already th uh, this year. Um, but uh, the other thing is, uh, oh, I wanted to mention about uh, our speaker was talking about uh, minimum wage. I, I don't think he understands the effect, the negative effect that minimum wage has on people. And, uh, and, and especially the, the terrible effect it has, it mostly affects uh, black people negatively because what you're doing there is you're kicking the bottom rung of the ladder out. So people, uh, unskilled, you know, high school students and things like that, that, people like that that need to get that first job, that entry level job at a supermarket or a gas station or a restaurant. When, when minimum wage goes up to $15 an hour or $20 an hour, uh, employers aren't going to pay that. Or they're gonna, if they do, they're going to have fewer people. So like when I, I go to Walgreens, all the time, almost every morning, I stop in Walgreens and I buy orange juice and, and snacks for work and things like that. And they've only have, they only have one cashier working. And this is in Chicago on the corner of Michigan Avenue and Adams, right across the street from the Art Institute. It's a big major city. <laughs> Here's this big store on the corner. It's a huge store, one cashier. Uh, and I go to McDonald's a lot for breakfast. Hey. They've got four uh, kiosks and like one person working behind the counter now. So uh, and by having by having this high minimum, I don't, you know, that's not a market wage, you're really just hurting uh, people more than you're okay, helping Bob, them. Wrap it up. And again, especially like you look at Biden inflation, you know, Biden's sure Biden's giving freebies away, uh, stimmy checks and okay. and all this and that and uh, all these this pie in the sky programs right. build back better and all that. But all it's doing is, is causing inflation, which is debouching our currency, making prices high. And these African Americans are going to be suffering from these high prices far greater for many more years to come. Okay, Bob, we're going to have to wrap it up there. All right, Charlie, you're next. Go ahead. All right, I mean, first of all, let's thank our speaker for a very nice presentation and for fielding some pretty tough questions. Thank you. Okay, I've only got four things to cover. Very quickly, we're running on time. Number one, <laughs> Bob, I don't buy into this inflation hysteria of the Republican Party. And perhaps you're not aware of it, that the Democrats come along and affect legislation to increase wages. So it is not a problem but that's the latest thing. Oh my, oh, I'm going to run home. Inflation will get me. All right, the problem is it is the Republican Party that is in trouble. They don't know how to shed Trump. Their base is diminishing as we speak. It has been going on for years. And it's presently constituted of the party which is anti-black, anti-immigrant or Latino, anti-woman's rights, and pro-gun. And I don't know if that's going to get you elected anywhere. That's why they have to play, change the rules of the game. If you're not going to win, change the rules of the game. And last of all, um, the Republicans are telling everybody do not vote for Democrats because they are socialists. This is their kind of message. But I read tonight that Janice put in chat that said, don't vote, don't vote for Democrats because they are not socialists. So I'm a little confused. I guess I don't vote at all. Anyhow, thank you very much. Okay, Margaret, you got four minutes. Go ahead and rebut. 
Okay, first, uh, I, I really want to thank you for giving a very balanced, um, objective, factual presentation. I really appreciated the fact that you um, debunk parts of Bob's uh, thing about, you know, the crime and the yada, 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 and compared to what it was in the 90s or even, or the 70s, for that matter. I mean, it was even higher then. Um, and second, please don't be a libertarian. Oh, God, please don't be that. <laughs> Um, you know, they're opposed to public education, they're opposed to public health, they're opposed to public services, they're, they're, they, um, they don't want to support the minimum wage, you know, they're just really appalling. They are appalling, sir, they are appalling. And they, um, anyway, so that's, that's actually all, I, I don't have much to say otherwise, um, that's all. Thank you. All right, Margaret, thank you very much. And uh, anybody else want to rebut real quick before I open? Yeah, the floor? Uh, this, this is Ellen. I'd like to rebut. Go ahead, Ellen. And then, Brian, you, 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 wanna, you already had a rebuttal. Okay. Um, so, first, I'd like to say that I, I am with, um, waiting on an extremely important phone call. And if that phone call comes, I will have to get off. I will, I'll have to stop my rebuttal short. Um, but um, let me go on ahead. Um, I think the Democrats um, uh, represent some really great things. Um, I am opposed to, you know, the Republicans tend to be anti-abortion and um, the Democrats are tend to be pro-choice. And I think that is um, very important um, to, issue. I think it should be for everyone. You know, also, I'm, I'm strongly in for, um, I strongly agree with Obamacare. Um, so I think that has saved a lot of lives. And I used to work at public aid. And um, I used to be involved with trying to make sure that people got uh, the Medicaid that they deserve. Um, it, it's, it's critical um, for people to be able to access health care. Um, some of the issues, can people hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Um, some issues though, I, 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 some things I do have an issue with. One is this whole way that Democrats, okay, our constitution, <laughs> first amendment, freedom of speech. Okay. Um, this is completely critical. If we want to keep a democracy, we must have freedom of speech. Um, if we want to prevent future genocides and other very serious problems, we have to have freedom of speech. Okay, yeah, okay the Democrats are trying to um, do uh, um, censor speech by proxy. They're they're pressuring um, Zuckerberg and uh, Twitter and these, these other social media, they are pressuring them very strongly to censor the speech. And that is something which should be, you know, if somebody is blatantly threatening to kill someone online, okay, that's one thing. But, you know, just because you have some difference in policy or beliefs, that is not a re or even some health measure that you might uh, disagree about some kind of health measure that is not reason to censor speech. The answer to speech you don't like is more speech, okay? Hence the college complexes. Um, um, so this that is something really serious and very dangerous and authoritarian-like that um, the Democrats are trying to do. Um, remember, um, you know, uh, 20 years ago, people said the Patriot Act was only going to be temporary. And now none of the Congress people bat an eye and they just go ahead and approve of it. Um, so these are real dangers to our civil liberties. I would recommend that everybody here start reading Glenn Greenwald. You can read them for free most of the, the vast majority of the time. Um, and another issue um, that I disagree with um, is these vaccine mandates. 
Now I got into a big argument with somebody, some people let last weekend about vaccine band-aids. And then the very person who was for injecting people against their will or pressuring people to be injected against their will, then we went to the health club together and I'm with my mask and they take off their masks. They took, they took off their mask. Um, and so what they're basically, people are just like, there's no consistency. They just do whatever the hell they want. You know, oh, well, you know, I don't want to be bothered to wear a mask, how other, other people should be forced to be injected against their will, despite the fact that, that it's being reported, supposedly, that if you're boosted, your chances are no, are, are no greater of dying of the COVID than are, are dying of the flu. So maybe we should mandate flu shots for everyone. Um, so I, I just think, you know, people, they're, they're, it's, it's, just, it's just crazy. I mean, you have the opportunity to get boosted, to get that vaccinated, to get um, boosted. And why are you so darn afraid of people who are unvaccinated? Um, I'd also like to say, I personally know of a situation with a woman who up until a day or two ago was being basically could not because of her particular circumstances, she could not get the vaccine. She just couldn't get it. Okay. And, um, and as a result, she hasn't been able to go to the health club. She has very few positive things in her life. That's one of the very few things she really likes. And it's like, it's been this devastating to her. It's devastating to these people, some of these people who are unvaccinated. And, and sometimes there is not even their cho real choice. Um, so um, why, that's don't, why, don't, why, don't, why don't they offer the vaccine at the health club? That's that's irrelevant. That's completely irrelevant. The point no, is, not. some people, some people, because of their uh, their particular circumstances, cannot get vaccinated because of complicated reasons. And oh, you mean for people, health? You and, mean for health? Mean for health? Why should why health should a boosted okay. person be so up for your chances of dying? According according to the like the New Yorker or the New York Radio okay. Hour right. and you NPR, your, you your chances of dying are the same as that with the flu. Why can't? Why are they so afraid? Jake, shut people? up. So that's all. That's all for my rebuttal. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I had. Why a should I be afraid okay. of somebody who's not vaccinated? All right, crazy? listen. Yeah, uh, when, when I'm seeing every yeah. day that vaccinated people are transmitting to other vaccinated people, all right, that's happening quick. constantly. Real quick, I had a. How would how would how would how would how would anybody know it? Are you do you, do you have a tag on your forehead telling you telling people that you've been vaccinated? I don't Did this so. meeting have any? Okay, I got a quick question. Did this meeting go crazy, <laughs> wacko, for a couple minutes? Because. <laughs> No, no. Why? Because I cr my computer crashed and I had to log out and re-log back in. That's why. <laughs> why should you be afraid of it's a, it's a computer virus? Is there is a vaccine for computer okay, no, virus? No. All right, all right. So that, therefore, nothing happened. All right. Thanks. Thanks for letting me know. All right. Okay. Now, hey, that, uh, Tim, are we are we doing can, uh, I, can, I, can I can I can I can I can I can I say I, I know I know that we had uh, I don't know who I, I don't know where we left off because I was off for a line for about four minutes there. You, you said you had uh, uh, you said you had like five people doing they, a rebuttal. They, they so did, and the five have football. gone. Okay, yeah. I want to I want to I want to make Ernie, a quick Ernie rebuttal Norman if I may. Ernie wants to do one. He's at the, okay. the other ones. Okay. Brian, we did one. I'll let Ernie go, and then we'll take you the last word. Okay, Kenneth. Okay. All right, Ernie, go ahead. Unmute, Ernie. Brian, we, we we're gonna have to pass you up now because you already did one of his rebuttals, okay? I, I think you mean Jake. You're talking to Jake. Well, Hi. Brian's also yeah, got right. to stand up too. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, Jake, we we, we let, let's let's uh, let let's let uh, Ernie. You have to unmute, Ernie. We can't hear you. We can't hear you, Ernie. Ernie, unmute. Ernie, 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 Ernie. Unmute, Ernie. Thank you. It wouldn't unmute. It was not responding. I was trying to unmute. I'm sorry. Oh. Okay, we, we got it. When you're on the only, I can, you can wave your arms or you can press the button or 
but you can holler all you want and people can't hear you until you now you. <laughs> um the thing is is that this is our last rebuttal and then we're going to let kenneth get his final oh, I, I want I, I want i want another rebuttal too jake, just no please. no okay. jake uh tell me uh, when you're ready for me Tim. all right ernie go ahead all right all right go ahead. um anyway yeah uh thank you uh kenneth for a very good and interesting simulating presentation uh, I agree with a lot of your concerns and your worries. I don't necessarily agree with all of your solutions. Uh, yeah, I vote Democratic because I think that uh, between the two, <laughs> what kind of a choice is it? Especially when, when Trump is on the ticket. Uh, I don't agree with a lot of the, uh, uh, the things they say, a lot of the candidates. Uh, I'm, I'm worried about Joe Biden. I voted for Bernie Sanders, but... Uh, but he didn't. That's that's why I think we need more parties because there's room for a, a moderate Democratic Party and a liberal Democratic Party, and uh, uh, I'd like to see that happen. I don't know that that is going to happen. I think the biggest the biggest sin is money in politics. You talked a little bit about that. Uh, I think uh, just getting money completely out of politics uh, uh, to to do that we have to. Um, uh, cut the demand rather than cut the supply. We keep trying to cut the supply of money as we try and uh, cut the supply of drugs. That doesn't work. What works is cutting the demand. And to cut the demand, we have to make uh, most of the ways that the politicians spend money uh, illegal and or very, very, not necessarily illegal, but very limited. For example, TV ads, the, the biggest problem, radio ads, and other forms of, of mass mailings and things like this. Candidates should be limited to, to public town hall type forums. And if they wanna go door to door, if they wanna go speak to a church or a, a PTA meeting or something like that, that'd be hard to control anyway. Uh, but uh, the, the big uh, spending should be, should be cut by making the spending illegal. Then the, then the candidates wouldn't have to spend half their time looking for money. Nice. They could spend their time on, on their jobs, which is, which is legislating. Uh, that, I think that's my, my main point there. I am concerned about the Democrats. I think Democrats still haven't figured out what happened in 2016. Uh, and and they, <laughs> they, they're, they're very much against Trump, which is fine. Uh, they, they may try and be against the Trump voters, but I, I keep reminding my Democratic friends, Trump got 74 million votes in this last election. Uh, he got 60 million the first time around. I thought that after he was in there for four years, that they, we knew he could still get a lot of votes, but that he dropped down a little bit, but he didn't. He went up to 14, uh, by 14 million votes. And why is that? The, the reason is that there are a lot of people very disenchanted with, with uh, government, and they blame a lot of that disenchantment on Democrats. And some of it, I think, is true. I think some of the Democratic policies are... Are, are, are foolish. So uh, uh, I, I don't know. I think the solution, the solutions are tough because getting rid of money in politics is very difficult because the people who are in politics would control whether we're going to get rid of it or not. I think you made a point, something like that, Kenneth. And then, and then in terms of getting a, uh, uh, a multi-party system, which would, which would involve some major changes, would also be very difficult. And in the meantime, we just have to struggle as long as best we can and see if we can find good candidates who will represent us properly when they get into office. Thank you. Thank okay. you again for your presentation. All right, Kenneth, final remarks. Okay, I, I just want to briefly, you know, kind of try to respond to, you know, each of the, uh, some of what I, you know, some of what I heard from the rebuttals. Okay. Uh, I heard that uh, you know Brian Brian uh, doesn't think the Democratic Party will change and um, and, uh, and 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 it may not change, but I think in the end it's going to depend upon what the uh, what ordinary people do and not depend upon what the people who run the Democratic Party want it to do. Uh, uh, they can be they they can be uh, over they they can be uh, essentially replaced or overturned depending upon how much a how strong a political movement challenges the Democratic Party from within. And uh, as far as me being libertarian, there was a couple of points on that. 
I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you a note. On a philosophical level, I'm a kind of a progressive libertarian by which I would I would support people deciding what they want to do with drugs or sex or whatever, or their religion, all of that I'm cool with. While I'm not the kind of libertarian that the Koch brothers are who think that part of their liberty is to destroy the climate of the earth. That ain't libertarianism to me. That's that's just plutocracy. So 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 I so I'm not with the you know that uh, unlimited uh, ability to or, or property rights and to do whatever you want with your capital. I don't buy into that theory of of libertarianism because you are actually impacting yeah. other people, and that ain't your liberty once you start uh, uh, affecting other folks. So that's the, the, what I had to say on uh, some of Brian's comment. On uh, Ellen, uh, wanted me to run for office. Uh, 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 ne ne neither I nor my wife would allow me to do that. I'm sorry, I can't do it. Okay, Bob says that inflation and crime are the problem and thinks that black people are voting for Democrats to, 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 to get reparations. I, I, I recommend for Bob that he read the 1619 Project, basically, because he has some really misconceptions about African Americans and about American history. Uh, uh, the short of it, uh, I'll give you a real simple, I'm going to give a short, just kind of short reference in history as to why African Americans vote for a particular party. African Americans are voting for their liberation. When Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party freed the slaves, Black people voted for the Republican Party for decades. Okay. But when Lyndon Johnson supported the civil rights movement and passed the civil rights legislation, that became our party. I'm going to tell you something interesting. As soon as the Democratic Party became Black People's Party, white conservative Southerners who used to support Jim Crow became Republicans. This should give you a hint as to why Black people are not going to vote for the Republican Party anytime soon. Because I'm going to tell you, those two populations, there are some people who think, well, why do Black people vote uh, for the Democratic Party or for one party? Let me give you a clue. We have two parts of our population that have almost consistently voted in an opposite manner. One group of people is black people. Everybody knows how black people vote. We're kind of uh, visible and obvious and we pay attention. But you know another group that also votes in mass for one political party again and again, generation after generation? Southern white people. And they, uh, they consistently do this. And what we're doing is we're voting on the opposite side of a question. The question is, are we going to be a multiracial democracy? Black people say yes. And white Southerners historically have said, no, no, we don't think so. And so that's why, that's one of the reasons why black people keep voting for the Democratic Party. If that changes in our culture in the future, if, if, if we imagine a future in which white Southerners are not threatened by phrases like Black Lives Matter, where they don't ask black people questions like, why is there Black History Month? There's no White History Month. When those things go away in our culture, oh, uh, well, you know, black people will be voting for both parties and white Southerners will probably be voting for both parties, but we're not in that world yet. I hope for it, but we're not there yet. Okay, Charles, the uh, Republican Party is is shrinking. In many ways, that's true. I can't disagree with that. Uh, but because they're shrinking somewhat, they they haven't they haven't shrunk. Uh, they haven't they haven't disappeared or go away. They are still quite viable and quite powerful. Uh, okay. Uh, Mar Margaret uh, just had a couple of friendly things to say. I don't have everything to respond to that, but thank you for your kind words, Margaret. Ellen, uh, 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 this is uh, this is a uh, this is a uh, oh this is uh, I'm gonna say second Ellen for lack of time. I think you got two ladies named Ellen. Thinks the Democrats have done some good things like Obamacare, and she's concerned with uh, um, with vaccine mandates and that sort of thing. Uh, what I want to say about vaccine mandates. I, 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 I lean strongly toward the uh, kind of scientific principle. And, and one thing I want people to remember, people who are saying they're forcing us to take vaccines. Well, you know, in my entire lifetime, they have been forcing little kids to take vaccines just to attend public school. There was polio vaccine and many other vaccines. You couldn't go to public school unless you got vaccinated. All of a sudden in 2021 or whatever, it has become a violation of my liberty to make me take a vaccine. That's, 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 a, that's kind of a really brand new theory. It's a kind of anti-scientific theory because 
very simple reason. Uh, uh, viruses are contagious. Uh, coronavirus is a deadly virus. It's about 900,000 dead people. Uh, you have liberty. I support, I support the idea of liberty, but I define it a little differently. Liberty is what you do that affects you. Once you're doing something that also affects me, we're not just talking about your liberty. Now we're talking about how other people's rights are affected. When you're unvaccinated and you're exposing other people to a deadly virus, it is reasonable for society to ask you to maybe not do that, to maybe help protect everyone else. Because whether or not you get a virus is not just about you. Uh, the Omicron variant of the coronavirus has an R naught of seven. R naught means how many people you tend to infect if you are infected by the disease. That means everybody who gets Omicron affects about seven other people. So the question of how they handle their Omicron or whether or not they're vaccinated or whether or not they wear a mask is not just their business, it's their business plus the vi business of the, uh, the, the, the average seven other people who are gonna get sick from, from their infection. So we have to take those things into account. Let's just tone it down. If someone wants to uh, create an authoritarian society, it's not gonna be through vaccine mandates. Uh, some of our authoritarian leaders in the world, not just Donald Trump, he didn't care about vaccine mandates. Neither does Bolsonaro, neither does Vladimir Putin. The, the authoritarians actually don't want to get you vaccinated. It's, 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 it's really very democratic countries who, who favor vaccinations rather than rather than the authoritarian country. So we have it kind of backwards. Uh, and, and so and anyway, so don't 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 worry about the jackboots coming with the with, with the people with the uh, needles. That's not how they're going to come. OK, Ernie, uh, uh, the. Um, uh, Ernie, Ernie is a. Uh, like a lot of the analysis, didn't necessarily agree with the solutions. Uh, wants to outlaw the way politicians spend uh, money. Uh, again, this is, uh, again, and I've, this is a debate I've been having again with my progressive friends ever since Citizens United was passed. You can't say the solution to have money in politics is to do something that requires you to already have control of the government. Because that means you will have already had the fight to get control of the government while money is still in politics. So you can't say, I'm gonna get money out of politics by passing a law that they can't spend money because that means you will already have to have won the fight. Otherwise you ain't passing nothing, okay? And given again, and, 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 and for people who are concerned about adding those folks to the Supreme Court, if you pass the law that tried to restrict how the billionaires can spend their money in politics, those six to three guys in the robes in the Supreme Court are going to politely overturn that law because they think money, which is essentially bribery, they say bribery is speech. <laughs> um, and, and, and then on the other hand, on the other hand, get ready for this because they're also trying to bring a case in the Supreme Court right here. They want to try to uh, change libel laws to make it easier to sue people uh, for politicians to sue newspapers. And so uh, remember I talked about an authoritarian society is going to try to stop the press from criticizing them. That, that's, 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 a, that's a potential pathway for them to do that. Okay. So overall, uh, I, I very much enjoyed you guys. I enjoyed the pres doing the presentation. Right. You enjoyed the discussion. Uh, had a good time. Uh, 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 I'm sure I'll be back sometime in the future. Thanks okay. a lot. Okay, at this Great. point, we're going right. to call a formal end to the College of Complexes meeting. You're free to go or stick around for the after party a little bit, but I am going to okay. stop recording and I wish all of you okay. a good night.